Good morning, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? I'd like to call the meeting, uh, the annual meeting of the Kearsarge Regional School District to order. My name is Derek Lick. I'm your moderator today. My goal is to allow for a free flow of discussion, allow for the board members and the municipal budget committee members to express their views as to what's before you and to allow all of you to have an opportunity to, to speak to them, ask questions. So let's get started today with a Pledge of Allegiance, please. Can I have you all stand and face the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Uh, today what we will do is we will run through each of the articles on the warrant uh, in the order that they're presented to us. We will have someone speak to each of those warrant articles and then we'll ultimately we'll open it up to discussion and then ultimately at the end of the discussion we will have a vote on each of the warrant articles. So let's get started. We'll start with article one which relates to the steam wing bond. This particular warrant article, because it is a bond, requires a 60% vote, uh, ultimately for passage at the end of our discussion. So I understand that uh, uh, school board member Emilio Canciobello is going to speak to this. Emilio, you have the floor. to see if uh, the district will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $22,270,344 for the purpose of financing the renovation and construction cost of the steam wing at the Kearsarge Regional High School. $22,270,344 of such sum to be raised through the issuance of bonds or notes under and in compliance with the Municipal Finance Act, RSA 33, colon 1, as amended, to authorize the school board to apply or obtain and accept federal and state or other aid, if any, which may be available for said project, including, but not limited to, New Hampshire Department of Education school building aid, estimated to be in the amount of approximately 30%, of the eligible project cost and to use such funds to reduce the amount of bonds or notes issued for the project and to comply with all laws applicable to said project. To authorize the school board to issue, negotiate, sell and deliver said bonds <coughs> and notes and to determine the rate of interest thereon and the maturity and other terms thereof and to authorize the school board to take any other action or to pass any other voter <coughs> vote related uh, thereto <clears throat> to further to raise and appropriate the additional sum of $556,759 for the first year's payment of the bond. Uh, as you all have in your uh, handouts, there is a school board explanation of this, uh, but we have um, a presentation that is going to be given by the uh, school superintendent, Winfred Fennerberg. Uh, it's a powerful presentation that will further explain this. <clears throat> and he will talk to this. Winfred. Okay, we're on. First of all, thank you for coming and uh, for being here to hear this uh, presentation to be at the deliberative session. Can we get the, okay. And we need the screen too. <laughs> Awkward moment. <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? Glad I came. <laughs> there is a presentation, I promise. Hey, Emilio. I thought you were supposed to be doing this. No way. Watch your head, Watch your head Ken. <laughs> you can go up, actually go up a little, up, 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 more, and good, thank you. This was all practiced long before. 
So um, this is about the steam wing renovation um, and construction. This is a, a picture of how the school uh, is supposed to look um, after the project is done. So it's about a program re redesign, it's about a renovation, it's about part of new construction. All three elements are crucial. Um, program redesign, uh, while not uh, evident in the physical layout and proposal, is really at the core of this. We did not feel comfortable coming before the voters and just ask for a new facility or a renovated facility and then think about how we fill that and what programs we would put into there. This, the, uh, the, the idea of program design really rests with a, a process that goes back three to five years with our high school teachers, with our administrators, with the school board, to really think about what do we need for our high school students, for all our kids uh, in the system um, at, at the high school level um, to be successful in life. So when we talk in program re redesign, we are talking really about what are the skills that kids need? How can we give them a leg up in uh, being um, high school graduates, going facing the job market, or uh, continue their education into the secondary or post-secondary level at college? So um, when we're looking at existing STEAM courses, and STEAM obviously is science, technology, engineering, applied arts, and math. What do we look at what we already have? We have adequate instructional space in this school um, for science, the physics, biology, chemistry labs were built, renovated in, I believe, 1996 uh, with the big addition. There will be little things that need to be fixed. There will be things that we will renovate as we go along. But in essence, we have uh, science is uh, functioning and is working in, in adequate spaces. Mathematics. Um, again, I don't mean to offend any math teachers in the audience, but it's, you can do math in, in almost any room. Uh, you don't need a lab for that. Uh, performing arts, you see where you sit here. This was renovated just before I came here in 2015. Wonderful new space um, that replaced the original auditorium that was built when the school was built in 1970. But we do have inadequate space, instructional space. And if you think about this school being built 50 years ago, there were no robots in 1970. There was, I don't believe, really any kind of computing that was going on, except maybe at NASA when they had these roomfuls of, of processors. We don't have adequate space. We make do, and our uh, robotics program has been very successful and has made do, but kids don't have a place here at the school to learn and then apply and practice and compete uh, with other schools. The application happens at the old SAU building, at the old middle school in New London. So kids, when they actually prepare for uh, uh, presentations or competitions with other schools or want to really build a robot, they have to go to a, a different site and, and uh, build that there. And we had to displace the robotics workroom several times in the last few years because we needed space for the elementary school. Uh, technical education. I think when most of you went to school, or some of you at least went to school, we had a, sh we had a shop, wood shop, and we had a metal shop, and we had many of the vocational programs in our schools. The state decided to build and support 20 technical centers. One of them is in Concord, one of them is in Newport and, and Claremont and Lebanon. Um, and we, ha we send our kids there for these more specialized trade um, and vocational tracks. We will continue to do that. that this project is not replacing a vocational uh, center. It's not trying, we ha have no ambition to do that because we don't have the funds and we don't have the, the setup. We don't have five automotive bays that we can get kids to become automatic, uh, automotive technicians. What we will do, though, is um, give kids an opportunity to have hands-on learning um, with, with the trades and learn basic skills that they can apply in a variety of ways. Our woodshop, for example, is a good example. Uh, when you go to the woodshop down here in the, in the wing, 
there are is a variety of machinery the kids do the best they can in one space this is not adequate because there is you can't do computer planning computer drawings you can't do modeling there because the dust from the saws will kill the com computers really quickly if you go though to the middle school when you built the middle school some 12 years ago 12 15 years ago we have a state of the art um, wood wood shop where you have a section where kids can learn be taught can plan and design CAD draw whatever they need to do to do the theory and then they go into the dirty room where they start sawing and polishing and painting all of the things that um, is the hands-on portion so kids at the middle school have that wonderful experience they come here and many of them would question why are we doing something that doesn't help us that that we don't know or is not practical digital photography graphic design visual performing arts those are all areas where many good paying jobs are available for kids that may decide not to go on to post secondary education so we have one of the purposes of this is also if you look at all these uh, bullets here there are modern, new, and good paying jobs associated with that that could be either available to high school graduates or could enhance applications to colleges and, and post-secondary education. Employers and colleges look for kids that have hands-on experience, that know project-based problem solving. This STEAM project is very much about project-based instruction it's about hands-on learning, and it's about combining different disciplines to, to create a project and a product. So no longer is it sufficient to take a physics class and then only do physics in that class. I think where we have moved and where we are moving actively in our K through 12 education is combining disciplines working together and all of these uh, areas together with English social studies history can be combined for a to solve projects and, and address uh, educational problems this is a, an interesting graphic that has not budged since I've come to the district and probably before we have consistently and and focused on uh, as a country on getting our students to a post-secondary university college education after high school. Approximately 75% of our kids, whoops, hang on a second. Oh, so this area, this green area, 75% of our graduates year after year, in fact, choose that path. They go to apply to colleges, they get into colleges, they, um, they have a solid education here and get into all the colleges that they wish to get into generally. But this slice, 25%, a quarter of our graduates do not make that choice, at least at the time when they uh, leave high school. They decide to go into family businesses, the world of work, they may join the military. And uh, we have not, in my estimation, really provided a full range of opportunities so that they stand out against other high school graduates. We want to change that with this STEAM edition. We want to look at skills that we can impart on them here at school that employers are asking for. Again, we're not making plumbers here at the high school. It's not about that. It's about having the ability to pr solve problems, get skills, in a variety of disciplines that can be applicable to many of our family businesses, to the industry around us. And one of the things we really want to do is we want to keep our kids in the area if they so choose. It's a good area to live in and to bring up a family. So what, what's under, when we talk about program design and program redesign, um, there has been a shift. You all know there has been a shift in the century and maybe even before. When in the past the high school diploma really allowed you to have, to raise a family, to have a very uh, good income and to be able to uh, have a lifelong career, 
that is shifting. It is shifting more to, um, you know, don't show me that you have 25 credits in, in a, in a, in a four-year high school career. Show me that you have the ability to, to be competent in what, what we are asking you to do. So credential, meaning like, how can we, how can we show that you have these skills and how can you demonstrate those skills? A college degree by, by itself is oftentimes not sufficient. We have heard those stories where kids go to four years of college and then they end up in your basement. This is not what we want to continue to do. We want to give kids an opportunity to be excited about career paths, to pursue career paths, and we want to be a high school where kids can actually learn this, practice this, and then advertise themselves to employers or to um, colleges as competent, as, as kids that uh, can go out in the world and uh, contribute. What's at the core of this? It's that cross-disciplinary learning model that we are trying to um, instill and expand. Our teachers here at the high school have spent the last three, four years and also at the middle school and beginning at the elementary school to think about project-based learning. You can, you can replace that middle, if I can, here we go. You can replace this square here with any kind of project. It could be building a bridge. It could be selling a backpack. It could be constructing a, a cart that um, a vendor can use in a mall. It, it doesn't matter what it is. The big point is that our thinking that we want to instill in kids is all about product design, how do I design this, what means do I need, computer design or just thinking, creative thinking. Um, then if you want to do that, any kind of project, uh, you have to think about advertising and marketing and legal and financial because you may build something very nice and very wonderful. If nobody wants it, it's not a concept that will live very long. But also when you think about courses we offer here in legal, finance, marketing, accounting. You've had business classes, our kids take business classes, but if it's just business in, in, in and of itself, or accounting, again, I don't want to offend any accountants in the audience, but if I think about an accounting class, it's very dry. <laughs> There's some response, thank you, yes. <laughs> but now think about if a kid wants to build a, say, a, a, a cart for, for the mall. If you now think about building your own business and you think about if I want to sell this and record my profit and I need to pay taxes and I need to pay employees, all of a sudden accounting, sales and, and purchase makes much more sense. We want education that makes sense for kids because if it does, they are much more invested. They want to learn and all of you know that if you're psyched about a, a project, you learn faster, you learn better, and it makes sense, and it's not a waste of your time. You know, we're doing pretty well with, with our high school graduation rate. That's close to 100%. But we want kids to be excited about their education and, and see how it has applicability to real life. Well, clicker kind of died. Let's do this. So, what are we asking for? This is a, the, the schematic that the architects have provided us. And actually, if anybody has questions later on, we have the architects and the engineers here. They can help us with specific questions. The current school is this outline here. Okay, we are sitting here. We are asking for two things. We are asking for addition, new construction, approximately 16,500 square feet. That's this area here and this area here. So a new front to the school as well as an expansion and renovation and 
uh, addition to the tech ed, techno, technical education, culinary, all those hands-on subjects that we're teaching here. That, and, and most of this equipment and, and those rooms are original to the building. And we are asking for or projecting a renovation of all these other, other colored areas here that you see. Um, altogether, the renovation will touch about 33,000 square feet. So the total project will impact almost 50,000 square feet of a 119,000 square foot school. So it's, it's sizable, it's significant, and that's where, when we later talk about cost, where there's, it makes sense that it's not a $5 million project. So we're looking at creating new space and renovating space that we have and make it functional under that heading of program redesign. For example, the, um, our library area here um, will see a touch-up because books in many ways are still needed but not the priority of a library anymore. It's a, it's a media communication center, it's a, um, a center of information uh, obtaining and, and sharing. So what are the key elements of the renovated and expanded spaces? Um, we currently have an art program that can service approximately 40% of the kids that are interested in, in art programs and art courses. We only have one teacher. That teacher works an extra shift, basically, uh, to accommodate more kids. Um, we have a huge interest in that, and we can't satisfy it. So we are asking that in that renovation and expansion, we will have two art rooms instead of one. Our current art room is also so crammed with stuff, including a kiln and materials and storage, that we can't have a full class of, say, 20 in there. It wouldn't be safe. So that is one addition where, and the only addition that I foresee that will also require one more staff member in two or three years when it's done. We need a second art teacher. It makes no sense to have two art classrooms and only one art teacher. So that we will ask with this, or a year, two years after, for a second art teacher. All the other teaching staff is here, has been doing the work, has been offering the courses, and is just asking for and looking for a new space to do it more efficiently. Graphic, art, graphic design, photography, printing, that will move into a shared space. We have a lot of 3D, print, three, 3D printers, we have printing materials. That is spread around the school. It makes more sense to put it into one central place. We have the technology to send all the projects to that central place. This is also a place where kids can perhaps take on some of the task of um, coordinating and helping out with um, the, the, the finishing of that. Music, our music room, our band room is very undersized. Um, it's, it's about 1,500 square feet. It should be 2,500 square feet. If you go to the middle school, you know what a music and a band room should look like. Uh, that is one of the, one of the uh, focus areas to put, and that's the applied art piece, uh, to increase the music room so that we have adequate uh, preparation and storage and music and instrument storage. Um, Okay, and we have computer science lab, robotics lab. Those are things that we don't, don't currently have other than a seven to 900 square foot box where kids work and, and, and learn. We want a functional uh, computer and, and uh, robotics lab. Tech ed, again, these, these things hang together. These disciplines already work together in many ways. They don't have the adequate space to do joint projects. We want to change that and provide that for them. Because more often than not, uh, two or even three disciplines in this, in this model that we have started to create work together. I just want to share a quick, a quick story about this. A few weeks ago, I came here um, and was looking for the culinary teacher. I had something to ask. I couldn't find her anywhere. So um, the, the room was, the kitchen was closed. So I came back at the end of the day and spoke to her and said, where were you? Well, she said, um, 
Well, we had a class in the gym because um, we did a lobster bake. Well, why did they do a lobster bake? Because the biology kids and teacher were studying the anatomy and innards of a lobster. So they were doing their dissection and they were cutting open lobsters, or what they do. I mean, apparently live lobsters are you know, good ones. Um, they studied that together with kids from the culinary program who otherwise may not have had an anatomy class. So the two classes combined in the only space that we could provide in the gym, which is not necessarily adequate anatomy lab. And then what did they do? Instead of ditching lobsters, the kids from the culinary program made a lobster bake for the staff. I was too late, I didn't know they were over there, so I didn't get any benefit of that. But this is just one really practical example how we combine content area that in the past we would not ever have combined and in the process allow kids to interact to problem solve and learn from each other and with each other and maybe kids that typically would not have communicated with each other get that opportunity and that's a value that this renovation can provide all over the place because we can have now the space to combine these in, in functional areas. Our culinary program, by the way, is also exploding. I mean, it, it's had almost tripled in terms of interest and we can't meet the interest because once again, our kitchen um, in, over, over there is accommodating perhaps eight to 10 kids um, for safety reasons. And they don't have a place really to serve what they cook other than have a couple of tables in the back of the room with a few chairs. It's not, it's not inspiring, let's just say that. So how does, these are just renderings. This is not how it's necessarily all gonna look like, but this is one of the example of the, the tech ed and robotics area. It's movable, yeah, it's movable equipment. It's uh, stuff that we can put to the side and then actually have the robots run in the middle and, and uh, practice. Now we have the room. You see computer banks here on the side where they can do the design and the planning of it. The, the view here is in the other tech area, so you can combine and go back and forth rather than having to trudge along the whole school to try to get to the hands-on part. Uh, our library uh, down here, Again, we still have bookshelves, we will still have books, but we also have more flexible room um, for kids to learn, study, and uh, communicate. Over here, the green room, we have television equipment, but it's, you know, it has to be set up. We, currently, our green room is, I think, a green sheet of um, um, cloth that we have to hang on the wall. There are, huge, there are huge career opportunities with media, with TV, with, um, with uh, video games. This is what kids get excited about and this is what we want to provide them. Uh, the picture over here is how the entry will look like. As you notice from the, from the design, um, uh, the layout, the front of the school will actually be moved to the front of the school. When you go down uh, North Road, you have to search for the school entry. This is not an ideal situation. Apparently it was you know, what we needed to do in 1996 with the addition to, to put that there but, and have that bus loop. But the front of the school should represent what the school is about and make it easy for people to, to find a way in. This is also allowing students to be checked in uh, for safety or, or visitors. And we will have a lobby space here that can be used by the community. Because there are many events in this school um, that can be hosted and are hosted for smaller groups. And instead of having to open up the whole school and having people go wherever they want to go, we can isolate this and have this uh, in the lobby and there's a flex room that can be open for lectures or other community events. Adjacent to the um, lobby is a little restaurant area that is connected with the culinary program. First of all, we will have an industrial style kitchen where kids actually can learn how to cook, apply all this and do it in, in a way that 
you would do in the real world. And then this will become, again, a community space or it's a possibility for kids to, to show what they cook and bake. I mean, I, I still think it's a great idea to have, uh, to have a two or three day a week offering to the community for having a cheap lunch here. You know, as, as I say, sometimes the restaurant scene in, in Sutton is not very vibrant. So this might be a great opportunity. And think about kids cooking and baking and planning and then accounting for and charging and, and doing all this with real people. To me, that's exciting. And to me, it's an opportunity for our community to be served, for kids to work and build the community and become citizens. And that's one of the big things that we're trying to do with our public education. Um, we talked about flexible classrooms are in that concept, 3D art room, calling it. We, we talked about all of this. Now there's one part of the project that is not STEAM, and we want to be upfront about that. Uh, the athletic locker rooms uh, are original. They are from 1970. If you think about athletics in the 1970, changing, showering, doing these kinds of things, uh, very different from what the standards are now. Fact is, many of our locker rooms or the locker rooms are not being used for what they were intended. They're storage or they're just dead space. We want to use this opportunity and renovate our physical education athletics uh, room with um, these things in mind, like proper private changing rooms for, for athletes and also for uh, umpires and, and adults. They should not just hang out in the same room. It's not appropriate anymore. Um, updated concessions and then storage, appropriate storage that's close by. Our gym is a wonderful space that we don't have to add the gym or, or change the gym. We also are not going to add any square footage to make it bigger or better or have television studios and you know, all the fancy things that other high schools may be able to do. We wanted to do the bare minimum. So that renovation project is included in this bond proposal. And it's um, just an opportunity to, to bring the 1970s level to today's levels. This is, the, again, the colored area is what, here are the locker rooms and over here. That's the only thing that's gonna be touched within the square footage of this concept. One thing too, we have an athletic trainer and her office currently is in this corner. It's essentially a glass box. And I feel very uncomfortable having a single person, female in this case, sitting at a corner of our school uh, in a somewhat vulnerable position. She needs to be where the kids are. She needs to be where the athletic director is. And her office will be moved into what currently is the administrative wing. Now the other piece that we need to face as a community, the school is 70 years, 50 years old. So when you start planning for a building project, you need to take the lid off certain containers and certain systems, right? When you see stuff that is end of life or not working properly, or not in, um, in terms of energy efficiency is 50 years old, um, you have two choices. Either you try to forget it, close the lid again, but you can't really unsee what you see. You can ignore it, and that's usually not an appropriate way to do things to the business. I don't want to build a, a nice shell around something that then breaks two, three, five years uh, down the road. The roof at this high school is on the replacement schedule for, I think, last year. We did not touch that because, again, it did not make sense to put a new roof on top of something that you then renovate underneath. We have to do structural enhancements in order to even meet building codes and snow load codes. So there is structural enhancements that make a, a mere roof replacement more expensive. Um, plumbing, um, duct work, HVAC and electrical systems are 50 years old by and large. 
The, the plumbing and the uh, HVAC in the newer, newer edition from 96 often doesn't play well with the old stuff. Nomadic controls here um, that rely on compressors and it's just not energy efficient. We want to increase wherever we can our energy efficiency. We have done much of this in the rest of the district with a, um, LED upgrades. So we want to continue and use this project to bring us up to, up to state of art uh, in terms of electrical and, and uh, HVAC systems. So this is for many the most interesting slide. Uh, the base cost of the construction is about 15.6 million. Now don't forget we are adding 16,000 square feet and touching 33 and a half thousand square feet. So for 50,000 square feet essentially. Roof replacement has to happen sooner or later, within the next few years. And that cost is estimated at 2.4 million. And then facilities upgrades and repairs, we can push some of these out probably a little bit, but it makes sense to put this in when you, if that bond passes when we do that project. That's altogether 2.6 million. The PE upgrade, uh, the locker rooms, that is one point almost $1.2 million. It made sense to the school board and the majority of the uh, MBC to, to ask for that, include that rather than wait and leave that space unused and, and old and not practical. And then lastly, the $300,000 charge for a, for a generator. Those of you that live in Sutton, you know that a tree falls and the power goes out. Um, we have had periods of time here uh, where the school had to be shut down because um, we had no power. Uh, food gets spoiled. Uh, our, our custodians run around like maniacs trying to, to get all the valves shut so that we don't freeze up. And they're mostly successful, but sometimes they aren't. With a new system, that wouldn't be the case as easily. But we also think that a generator to protect our investment is a smart idea to have at this school. It will not be big enough and expansive enough to run full operations, but it can get us through the day and we don't have to dismiss kids at nine if the power goes out. So the total project cost is 22 million 270, uh, 244. This is just phasing. Uh, obviously we can't do a lot of the construction while school is running. We have a full functional school and we have kids coming every day. So what you see, I apologize for the, for the darkness of this, but um, this area here will be built while school is in session from 23 to 24. These parts that include are in, within the school will need to be done over the summer. So what's the time frame? That's an aerial view of that as well. What's the time frame? If the bond passes in March of 22, we will have a full year and a quarter to secure contracts, get the best prices that we need, apply for building aid and, and other funding sources for a start of construction in July 2023 with an end point of September of 24. And with that, I leave you with that we're trying, in the spirit of last year's word of the year for the district, to work together for the future of our educational, um, of our learners. Thank you very much, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation, we appreciate it. Um, so our next step is uh, to open it up for questions and comments from the members of the public, all of you. Um, I have been corrected in one way though, I mentioned a super majority vote being required. That is true when this bond article goes to our town meetings and we actually vote on it at the ballot box. But for today's purposes, we just need a simple majority vote in order to put it on the ballot for uh, the town meeting vote. So I hope that clarifies things. With that, is there anyone that wishes to speak uh, to article number one regarding the bond that we've just heard about? Come on up to a microphone, please. And I've been instructed to make sure that when you come up and speak that you let us know your name and your address so we can make sure it's uh, in the formal record. Thank you, come on up. 
Good morning. My name is Holly Buckley. I'm from 13 Brown Road in Sutton. Thank you. So I have some basic questions. Um, it's a great wish list. I think as a parent, I uh, have been a parent. My kids are in their 30s out of a different school system. I really appreciate education. I have a doctorate. I am very much a proponent of helping education as much as we can. But I think we need to back up and take a look at some of these segments. Um, one, is with, one of which is, what is our student population in the lower grades now? What is the trajectory of the population number for high school? Thank you. Let's see if anyone wishes to speak to that. Good okay. question. If I can take that. Um, ever since I came here in 2015, we have done 10-year projections out um, for exactly that question. You don't want to build something and have a declining student population and then have a lot of empty room. Since 2015, um, the, the projection for the district um, enrollment has been extremely steady. So we are bucking a trend that's affecting the rest of the state uh, with declining enrollment. We have maintained an enrollment and are projected out until 2031, an enrollment for the district of about 1,750 students, uh, preschool through, th through grade 12, and the high school population around 530 to 550. Very stable from 2015 on up to what, again, 10-year projections this October involve four years where kids aren't even born yet. But I think it speaks to this area being very stable and being very attractive, quite frankly, for young families to come in. So what is the size of the classrooms now? How many students in each classroom? It, it varies depending on uh, if you have a freshman class with uh, Mr. Langell can talk exactly to that. They can be over, over 25 at times to very specialized AP classes that we offer that are about eight uh, or in, in some cases less if, that, if there's a student interest there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Come on up, please. And again, let us know your name and address, please. Joe Cardillo, um, 173 Siemens Road, New London. Uh, first of all, thank you to the NBC and school board. I know you, this just wasn't thrown together in the last few months. You've been at this for years. Um, we are at a time where uh, low interest rates and everything, there's some compelling reasons to do this. Um, I don't want to open up another discussion that I think has already happened with regard to in, in light of just uh, improving the STEM program. Do we need athletic field upgrades and everything? We'll leave that for another time. I think one compelling reason that I haven't heard addressed tonight, that, or this morning rather, um, I'm usually in evening meetings, <laughs> is um, the fact that um, I believe we have a bond that's going to be retired at some point in the future. There is, um, uh, Winford, you said 13, 15, it, it flies so quickly. I don't know what our, if someone can tell me what the bond was on the middle school project, I'm assuming that was our last largest bond. Uh, you've been very thorough to show us what the um, impact would be for each town on taxes, which is quite helpful. I think it would also be quite helpful and, and help this move forward to let people know yep. that we are going to be retiring a bond at some point here fairly quickly. How much was that bond? I mean, I know we're, we're going to be in excess of 1.345 million a year in principal and debt service, but we may have an equal amount that's coming off the other side fairly quickly. Can someone address that, please? I'd be happy to start, and then Larry can be as the numbers guy, give you exactly the numbers. The middle school, there's actually two bonds out there. There's a, uh, the Honeywell bond, which is a, very, is a smaller bond that will be retired in 2025. And then the middle school bond, the last payment is made in August of 26. So there will be, regarding the middle school bond, there will be four years of overlap and uh, where we have those two bonds. And then once that falls back, uh, falls off, we are below what we're currently paying for the middle school. And in the meantime, we also have that smaller two million bond retire uh, in 2025. Did I get that right, Larry? He'll, he'll do it from up there. I guess he nodded, so it's, I'm probably right. <laughs> the uh, middle school bond was 24 million. Right. Thank you. 
And just again, for what you brought up, Joe, the middle school bond cost us 4.6%. Um, this bond, again, the, Larry's discussions with the bond bank trying to plan out, they are very conservative because they do not want to promise and then not deliver. It's currently calculated at 2.5%. I think the actual rates are more in the 1.7, 1.8 range currently. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Ken Bartholomew here. I'm the chair of the school board and a rep from Warner. Um, this is a, a, a topic of some discussion because uh, between the school board members and the MBC as well, um, you know, it would be ideal to be able to wait four years till the middle school bond came off the books to start this project. But by and large, the members didn't think that was fiscally responsible. Because if you look at the situation with rising inflation and an expectation of rising interest rates, if you have that 2.5% up to, you know, raise up to 4.5% 4. 4 in those four years, you're going to suffer a tremendous uh, increase in cost. Larry, if, it's a four per five, if it were 4.5%, what would the additional cost be? For every half percent, it goes up 1.1 million. So <laughs> that... You know, while, while I personally, and I know other folks, um, and I believe the member of the NBC who, who voted uh, not to recommend this article, um, that was the big concern, is doing it now as opposed to waiting when the middle school bond comes off the book so that the tax impact is, you know, not as, there's no doubling up, it doesn't affect it. But to do that, you really would increase the cost. I think there's also an expectation from the architects and the engineers that the project costs would also increase uh, quite a bit. Um, and that is what we saw when the middle school didn't pass the first couple years, two or three years. Uh, we ended up spending more and getting less uh, as a result of it not passing the first year, which is unfortunate, but sometimes that's the way it goes. And if I may just add to that, I have done talks in every of the communities so far, um, and several of them, that this question comes up a lot, uh, the question about timing. I have two thoughts about that. If we wait four years, that's a whole generation of high school kids and all of the middle school kids that are coming up and elementary parents' kids. As the educational leader, I don't think it's, it's right for me to say, we'll wait four years for that bond. Educationally, I need to advocate it for, for that now. And uh, the second reason is about timing. Um, it is, in my chair, very difficult to coordinate with seven towns and needs that individual towns have, fire departments, uh, you know, fire trucks, or whatever else they, they have in expenses, to find that exact sweet spot where everybody is in alignment. I don't think that is ever going to happen. Um, so I, I'm very aware that different communities have different obligations coming up or already entered into. Um, I'm here as, as your you know, district superintendent to, to say this is a project that I'm, I'm fully behind, and I hope that it passes. Thank you for the question and for the answers. Anyone else wish to uh, comment or ask questions about Article 1? Yes, go, come on up. I'm Bob Wright. I'm on 67 Blaisdell Hill Road in Sutton. And my question has to do with the relationship between trust funds and uh, capital reserves. Normally, renovations, anything to do with the building is placed in a capital reserves as it regards to municipalities. And I've never been quite, and I wonder if somebody could give me a short primer of what the similarities and the differences of a capital reserve and a trust account, and also, why this has not been used, say, for example, this impending renovation of the building, which is, I think, in concert with the STEAM program, but not as a result of it. Would somebody explain that to me, please? Thanks. It's a good question. Uh, we do have a uh, building construction uh, trust fund. Um, it was set up in the 1990s, and it has $187,000 in it. Um, we haven't added to it year after year because there have been other priorities um, that we've felt are even more important uh, 
and we also knew that it wasn't going to be able to come close to touching uh, something as large as a project like this. We also have a roof repair and maintenance fund that was set up, I believe, in 2000 or thereabouts, and that has about $800,000 in it. Um, that could be utilized as part of the funding, um, but we have to also be cautious because you know a new roof on one of any one of our seven buildings in the district uh, could easily take up that amount of money. Thank you. Any further questions? Go ahead, Bob. With all due respect, I'm more than mildly horrified for that answer because it's the largest item that we've got, this building and the buildings that you own. And you're talking $187,000, and you're talking about a budget of $47 million. You're talking about a growth aspect, a renovation to be able to provide needed, needed learning centers for students of $22 million. And you're talking $187,000. With all due respect, and I'm gonna quote Je Walt Chadwick, what the hell are you thinking? Well, thank you for the comment. I'm not sure if anybody wants to respond. I, mean, I can only just repeat what I said. We have other priorities in the district and we didn't want to uh, put the cart before the horse by adding what would have to be an extremely large amount in, since the time that this project was even first a glimmer in someone's uh, thinking um, in order to defray what is a you know, multi-million dollar project. We would have had to add those before we had voter approval to do it. Um, and it just didn't seem responsible. What we decided to do instead is to return money to the district from budget surplus. That's typically how we fund our, um, our trust funds, out of money from budget surplus. Um, and when we have an overage of that, it goes back to the towns as a credit for next year's taxes. If I just may, if, if I may just add one comment, Bob. Uh, we, we have utilized our uh, emergency, the trust funds, uh, for example, when we were faced with uh, emergency repairs to our oil tanks in the district, we did, that was not budgeted. That was one of the decisions the board took to take money out of that to address that need during the year. Um, likewise, we, the, the roof fund, uh, there was a di discussion obviously in the facilities committee about the Warner roof, whether to take this out of the trust fund and use that money. Um, at the time, it was felt that we had enough budget surplus to address that there and leave the, tr the, the roof trust untouched. So these were just dis discussions, dis decisions. Sometimes we use the money and largely we tried to save it for emergencies. Thank you. I see someone else wishes to comment. Please state your name and address, please. Good morning. Randall Nisdor from 13 Brown Road, Sutton. Uh, for the last 40 years, I've been recipients of products from high schools, both in the military and in high volume manufacturing in the automotive industry. My positions in the automotive industry was engineering and engineering management. So you're gonna do a lot of money spending here over the next four, two, two or four years. How do we understand that we've achieved what we're supposed to be doing? What's our metrics? How do we know we've improved? Because I've gone on and looked at the State Department of Education's performance your metrics, math, reading, writing, we're not doing that great. So how do we improve? How do we know that we're doing better? I don't, I don't see a metric. I, you did all your presentations. I, I saw a graph about what percentage your students go where. I don't see where we say at the end of four years we've actually improved and we actually put a better product out in the workplace. I've hired them. I've used your resources in the military around the world and in this country in manufacturing from Hillsborough, New Hampshire, all the way to the automotive industry in the Midwest. I know what we need in the industry. We're not, we're not generating if we can't do math, if we can't do writing, if we can't do reading and have comprehension. And then we could talk about discipline and stuff like that. How do we set up metrics so that this money that we're spending is well spent. And we as taxpayers can say, yes, you've put a better product out into the marketplace. Right now, I don't see it. If I was back in my world, I would vote no on your expenditure because I don't see accountability to the taxpayers 
you've actually put a better product out in the marketplace. Thank so you. So I would like to hear what you're going to plan to do if you want us to vote yes. Because I'll be out there saying no, 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 because you guys aren't doing your basic job of showing accountability and showing the metrics to the taxpayers. Thank, thank you for your question. Perhaps Superintendent Penneberg? Sure. Well, thanks for that, that comment. Uh, I, would, I would counter with an invitation to come to the high school, have a conversation with our principal and our curriculum leaders um, about that. I do know that uh, state testing, if you look at the, um, the test results, if you just look at that one metric, uh, is probably pretty average with other high schools. Um, what counts for me is that um, from, the, from the reports that our students report in terms of going po on to post-secondary learning, they are successful in going to all, pursuing all the careers and pursuing all the, um, the, the post-secondary learning that they, want, that they want and that they apply for. You are right, and I think that's why I'm very concerned about that the other 25% that go directly into the job market I, I do think at the core of this proposal is to address your, the issue you bring up, to excite kids, to, to get kids to be active learners in a, in a society that has changed significantly over the last four or five decades. Um, you know, we, we do not operate in isolation. We take all kids that come through our doors. We do not have, in terms of, um, pre-selection, any choice like other institutions, private schools or others have um, in terms of abilities, disabilities, outlook, interest, and, and family values. We take, we take everybody from our community. And that is, um, I think, at the core of this proposal is to find ways to um, adjust, adapt, improve uh, the learning of all students that come through our doors. The metric is how many kids are successful in life. The metric is how many kids do go to, to colleges that they wish to go to. How many kids find productive work? And I see our assistant superintendent, Bissett, coming up who may address additional points. Um, to the good citizen, thank you. I appreciate the comment, too. And I, I just would take one second to point out the fact that when you point out the state assessment testing results in comparison to the other school students that are throughout the state, I think one needs to ask the question, how valid is the assessment in comparison to what we're really looking to understand about our kids' performance? And simply, a, a, the tests that we are offering at that standardized assessment are a measure against the state standards, which were written quite some time ago. And the focus in this district, and frankly across New Hampshire, and frankly across the country, is moving towards competency-based assessment. If you would like to see an ideal assessment describing exactly what you are describing as an industry-based assessment, you need to look no further than what we are doing with competency work and what others who are working in Concord, for example, at the CITC, when they look at some of these programs that they're offering, they're using industry standards. They're actually going to the industry. They're having industrial experts who are actually in the field, who are training their workers, develop the assessments for those industries. And they bring that back to our instructional models. And then those kids are asked to demonstrate their competency as if they were in the field. So it's all relative. If you're asking us whether or not the projective results of the standardized assessment where they go into an environment and take a black and white paper pencil test and circle A, B, C, or D is going to project whether they're going to be successful in your industry, I tell you the answer is no. There's, I can tell you stories of kids who literally are so apathetic about taking that standardized assessment that they took it and wrote the answers in French and disqualified themselves. And that rejected the scores for that particular school. That's not an exaggeration. But I can also tell you stories of kids who went into those industry-based standards and rocked the world and got jobs and who are currently making more money than I do still in high school who are doing coding and reporting of information right now for businesses. So <laughs> gotta ask yourself, are the assessments that people are reporting at the state level accurate and are they reliable and are they valid? Thank you for the question and the comments. Anyone else wish to speak to article one with respect to the bond vote? Yes, come on up please. I might have to tip this down. 
Sarah Anderson, 284 Greeley Road, Springfield, New Hampshire. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for the time you've spent to put this together. Um, I'm not a numbers person, <clears throat> but I sort of wanted to speak um, as someone who has been part of this district on some level or another many years. I attended high school here myself. Um, and I just wanted to say to the community that um, I have children who, you know, frankly, they will never excel uh, in, a, in a math test. They will never become lawyers or doctors. Um, they have some, some disabilities that just will make, makes it more difficult for them to achieve that. For me and my family, um, to see the school district work really hard to put together um, something that provides much more hands-on, um, real-world experiences for my kids um, is, it, 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 um, it, it makes me really appreciative and, and thankful. And I say, man, I wish this had been in place years ago when I attended high school here because I feel like it could have made a world of difference in what I was able to do with my life. Um, I also wanted to just say that I was, I have my son and his girlfriend both graduated from this high school in 2017 and 2018. They were really into the robotics program that Chris Spooner runs. And at that point in time, um, they would spend hours, and I mean hours, uh, sometimes they were working until midnight in um, sort of a, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad because it is what we have, but uh, in the old middle school in New London, um, sometimes it was cold, sometimes the roof was leaking, there was stuff everywhere, all over the place. And this group of really passionate students who wanted to learn these skills, um, that, that's where they, you know, they built this incredible robot. And I'm not sure if anyone in the audience or anyone in the community has ever attended um, a robotics competition on sort of a statewide um, level, but before I went to my first one, I thought, man, I really don't know what I'm getting into. I can't imagine what this robotics competition is gonna look like. And I was amazed um, at the incredible things that these students are doing. The students from Kearsarge were able to do even with very limited access and space. And I think if we could provide our students, future generations, the kids coming in, um, a better facility, a safer facility, um, and, and a better place for the teachers to work with these students and really give them these hands-on experiences where we're like handing them, our, our kids and future generations, a, a pot of gold. Um, and I just wanted to add that it was very clear as a parent when you go to these robotics competitions on a state level, um, Kearsarge does not have the same um, abilities and the same resources that some of these other districts in the state have. And it was clear that that made it difficult for them to compete on the same level um, as some of these other robotics teams. And I just would like to encourage the community to vote yes for this. It's, it's critical for our students and um, our future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Anyone else wish to speak to Article 1, having questions or comments? Yes, come on up, please. Margaret Duty, 15 Atwood Road in Wilmot. Um, I just wanted to share a comment from the listening session we had in Wilmot when the superintendent came um, to share this presentation with us. And it's about just the standard regular students who are gonna go on and go to college and do the regular thing, which is what my daughter did. And there was a question about, okay, well, this is all great, but you know, what about English performance and writing essays and <clears throat> that type of work? And there was a very interesting comment, I think it was from the superintendent's wife who also attended the session, which I commend her doing. And she said- I'll pass it on. <laughs> she said it's a lot different, and she's, an, she's been an English teacher, is that correct? It's a lot different when kids write an essay about something they care about 
instead of writing the typical essay about what did Mark Twain mean when Huckleberry Finn did something. And um, that sparked a real conversation because even the kids who may be on a standard track, if they're gonna be writing some kind of communication to present their idea, they're gonna really wanna make sure they're doing it the best that they can, if they're really invested in it. And they may take a little bit more time and dig a little bit deeper and do it a little bit with more excitement than Huckleberry Finn, although I have nothing against Huckleberry Finn. So I just wanted to pass that along, and um, the superintendent made that comment also with accounting and math. You know, there were a lot of things in math I didn't care about until I had to look after the library finances. So um, I just think it's giving these kids, even in the traditional track, more opportunities to dig a little bit deeper in some of the standardized tests that we see about reading ability, math ability, those types of things. And I just wanted to mention that. Thank you for your comment. Yes, Ken. Thanks. Um, I've given this a little spiel a few times before, but um, I'm one of those privileged people that um, got to go to a college prep school in Buffalo, New York, and then on to a very good college, uh, and then law school. Um, and people ask me, you know, some, my wife tells me I'm dangerously overeducated. Um, I think she's probably right in a lot of regards. Um, but they, people have asked me, you know, what, what did you learn in those schools that was the most valuable to you? Uh, I'll tell you, it wasn't sitting there in, you know, uh, English history class. It wasn't sitting there in my English class, although I did a lot of good writing. Um, but what gave me the most benefit really was the work that I did in the performing arts. And I didn't do acting ever in college, but I spent a lot of time backstage um, and doing production management, um, doing set design and lighting design. And what I learned is how to manage a project, how to work collaboratively with, with people, how to advocate for, uh, with superiors to get budget funding, uh, and then how to reach a goal that we set ourselves in order to reach. Uh, that was the things that are most valuable in my career now because I still do those types of things. Get a project that I need to put together, work collaboratively with, with people, figure out how to fund it, uh, and then you know, try to reach an end result. That's what project-based learning is all about. That's what we're trying to teach kids in these programs uh, in order, to, you know, even if it's arts, right? It's applied arts. It's how to take what you're learning and reach a goal, maybe a goal that you've set yourself, and to do it with the guidance of people around you and faculty members who can formulate and assist in that manner so that kids get that experience. And frankly, I think that's what business needs. I think it's valuable not just for the kids who go right into the workforce from high school, but it's also very valuable to the kids who go to, on to college, two year or four year. And frankly, it's not being taught enough at college. Um, so I think we, we really need to give those skills as quickly as possible to our students. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Here, I'm sorry, yes. You hand her the... I'm supposed to just tap this yep. telephone. Yep. On. Am I on? Hi, Kristen Schultz, Newberry resident, school board member, and licensed high school teacher. I um, really appreciate all the comments and questions that I heard today. I will speak specifically to a few things. First, standardized testing um, is unfortunately a, a measure that measures very little in terms of academic performance. Um, and I won't go into all the things that it does measure, such as emotional distress or poverty or a fight with a other person or all of those things. So I think that standardized testing has really skewed the way people measure academic success. Um, secondly, when we look at the application of skill set, you know, if we are talking about the Bloom's taxonomy. We have rote memorization on the bottom and synthesizing an application at the very top. And that's where the skill set is really, um, you know, it comes to fruition. And 
to standardize testing is not an application of the top of the Bloom's taxonomy, but project-based learning is. And as a teacher, I will tell you specifically that many students will say they are on a college track because that is the only path that schools throughout the country are offering as, a, as an option. And having worked with multiple grant organizations um, trying to close the gap between getting into college, which people do very often, but being able to stay in college for a number of reasons are two very different things. So this project really hits the needs of not just learning and, and pedagogy, but it hits the needs of interest and of exploration and gets to the root of what actual learning and application is. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good morning. My name is Christine Perkins, and I live at 64 West Main Street in Warner. Um, I applaud the STEAM system to, um, and what um, all of you are trying to do. I just have a question about the finances. Um, I understand that there are federal funds, ESS, ER funds available for mechanical and other upgrades. Um, through the federal government for COVID-related funds. And I was wondering if those funds had been looked into yet. And my other question is, if we get funding from other sources, whether it's the state or federal government, and the bond is set at $22 million, how if we get the funding, how does that in return affect our what we have to pay? How you know, how does that affect it if when you finally do get funding? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Anyone able to speak to this? Larry, can you address the second part of the question? If we get additional funds, how does that impact the bond payment? Yeah, that'll just reduce the bond, so it would be revenue coming in. It's revenue coming in to as reducing what the every year the taxpayer would have for net revenue. So you still pay for the bond $1.6 million per year principal, but it's offset by every year you'll get revenue that goes against when we say a reduction of revenue, so it nets to the taxpayer. So if we were to get um, cooperation funding from um, businesses in the in the area that want to support this cause. And you know, this could be buying a table or buying a storage closet or buying a, a, a virtual reality program for that and make that a contribution. It would be offset in the general fund in terms of what we need to ask uh, the seven communities to come up every year. You asked about ESSER funding and the federal um, supports that we get to specifically to mitigate um, the effects of, of COVID. We have taken advantage of all three rounds of funding, plus even gotten some funds from FEMA um, in the past. The third round is um, currently we are looking at specifically for ventilation and for uh, air quality, we're looking at uh, uh, using those f uh, portion, a good portion of that federal fund to um, look at air conditioning at the middle school because that was one of those things that was not done, could not be done at the time and affects those air quality issues that are specifically outlined where the funds can be used. Um, ESSER funds, I would, it would be very difficult to say that we can fund those for a tech ed lab or a robotics classroom or that kind of renovation. But we are making, uh, taking advantage of every penny and every dollar we get from federal funds. And again, in that regard, uh, FEMA funds is a good example where uh, for a while it said schools couldn't apply and then Larry found some way for us to secure almost close to $20,000 through that funding path. And that goes into the general fund so that next year you have to pay $20,000 less for expenses here. Thank you for the question and the responses. 
Anyone else wish to speak? Just one moment, sir. Is there somebody who has not asked a question yet? Come on up, and then I'll uh, have you come back up again. Thank you. Hi, I'm just a little confused about... Oh, sorry, uh, just a moment. Can you give I'm us your sorry. name and address, please? Yes, I'm Susan Thank Knight, you. and I live at 198 Barker Road in Sutton, New Hampshire. Uh, just a little confused about some of your comments. So the project-based learning paradigm, am I to understand that that is not currently being implemented and that we will have to wait for this new project to be in place before it can be implemented? Excellent question, and thank you for that question. No, it's in fact, it's the reverse. We have spent the last three to five years on working on competency-based, project-based learning here at the high school and throughout our district. It really applies to preschool all the way up to 12th grade. Our high school teachers have taken many opportunities to do exactly that, to, to, to look at project-based learning that we can apply and implement to the best of our ability here with the, with the facility. It was my concern that we do not come before the voters and say, we want a new building or an improved building, and then we'll do project-based learning. In fact, conversations as far back as four or five years were with the administration, with the teachers, we need to reverse that process. We need to show that we can do this and do it to the best of our abilities, and these teachers have really risen above that. And, uh, and now it, it's time to ask for the facility to implement it in the, in the better and more appropriate way. So thanks for that question, it's very important. And I do appreciate your efforts um, in, in improving the educational opportunities of your students. You, I think you've done a great job. One more question. Sure. Uh, to Mr. Wright's uh, comments earlier, um, I just want to clarify. It sounded like you said that rather than putting aside funds into capital reserve funds, as some of the towns have done, you have chosen to return them to the residents, taxpayers. Is that correct? Yes. Every year um, in the last um, all the years I can remember, actually, um, we've had a budget uh, surplus. In the last few years, um, it's unfortunately been because we haven't been able to hire all the staff that we need, especially with regard to custodians, um, substitute teachers. Um, we haven't had to pay as much as busing because we are short bus drivers in the district, not district employees, but that's a third party that we use to do the busing. Um, and as a result, we budget for what we need if we can't spend that money, that is money that is saved. T typically, in this district, we have funded trust funds out of that budget surplus. Um, and we have in those years, uh, in past years. Last year, we put money into the Building Repair and Maintenance Fund. We put money into the Special Education Trust Fund. Those are now very close to their target amounts, where we don't feel like we need to continue to do that past this year, um, or at least not more than two years. Um, that's what I meant by that. So there's excess funds in addition to that. Those get returned to the taxpayers. When I say that, you know, you don't get a check. Uh, what happens is the towns get a credit to their bill for the next payment for the school district uh, taxes. Did I have that right, Larry? Did I make any mistakes? Yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, Charles Langell. I'm the principal here at Care Sarge. Not a resident, would love to be, so. Two car garage is kind of the minimum I'm looking for. So if you know something, let me know. Um, Good luck. I absolutely do love the community. Uh, it, it just kind of a point that actually touches on the last two questions. One, you know, being credentialing, the other, the project based learning going on at the high school already. And when Superintendent Fenneberg was talking about, you know, only 40% of those culinary students getting into culinary, there's credentialing that can happen through these programs, and some does. So when 40% of the students that want to get into a culinary program are getting into that, they're getting knife skills and safety skills, OSHA skills, uh, things that are required to get into the door of working in the kitchen as opposed to the front of the house. They can get those things right out of high school and get that higher paying job in the restaurant right away. But really what we're doing is we're only meeting 40% of the needs. The other thing is currently that, that we have is under ELOs, these independent learning opportunities that kids get to do. There's one student right now as part of his senior project is on track to make about $8,000 as a high school student flipping small engine things. And he's actually teaching other students 
as well as even the teachers, and it's a phenomenal thing that he's able to do through this. And if with increased facility and ability to do this, this can expand to other students. And one last piece to tie onto that, um, for those students that are going on to college, I have worked you know, approximately 10, 12 years in school counseling where I was helping students get into colleges. And you may or may not know this, but one of the secrets to getting into schools like MIT, especially into their artificial intelligence programs and things like that, you have to have a project that you developed and designed and implemented to some capacity. That's like one of the biggest things that'll give you the edge up. And by doing these kinds of things and having this opportunity, even our college bound students will have a better leg up at getting scholarships and getting into the colleges of their choice because they'll have that unique opportunity. And those are kind of the credentials that they can get currently, but not a lot of students are able to because of the size of the space. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else who has not yet spoken wish to speak to Article 1? Oh, one more, go ahead, come on up. Andrew Pennard, 12 Church Street, Bradford. Uh, I would echo and reinforce the statements already made about project learning in our district. It actually goes back prior to four or five years ago. It's been ongoing. And in fact, my daughter who graduated in 2018 went on to college for marine science. And every year she uses skills that she learned here at Kearsarge uh, to adapt to the work she's doing in climate change research. And in fact, she's come back every year to work with students here at Kearsarge to talk about what it's like to go out and work on the boat to do climate research and do the mechanical aspects of it. So it's really important to understand that project learning is not a new idea. It's something that's been being worked on and I applaud the school district's recognition of that and investment in that area. I also wanna counter one statement earlier that I would like to remind all of us that our students are not a product. Each of our students come through with a unique experience and this district works very hard to provide a number, a variety of opportunities to allow them to explore and expand their passions and their capabilities that will then lead them to success uh, moving forward. So I deeply appreciate this uh, process that this uh, project has gone through. It is a culmination of a continued series of projects that have happened in the district, including the Professional Development Center, including the renovation of the auditorium itself. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I applaud the uh, inclusion of the, the uh, physical education plant, that aspect, because that's another aspect that's really important. Students participate in athletics because it's part of the whole body experience. An athlete oftentimes is uh, someone who is seeing increased blood circulation to their mind and it actually helps to make them focused and keep them uh, in line to be able to be more involved in what's going on here. So while I was not an athlete, <laughs> um, I have to express my deep appreciation that this addresses a deep-seated need the district has had for a long time. So thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else who has not yet spoken wish to have any comment? Yes, come on up to the microphone, please. I only sit here for so long, I think. Charlie, you'll have to let us Charlie know. Charlie Forsberg from Thanks. Sutton. I must tell you right up front, I was greatly disappointed when I went to the school high school website and wanted to learn about the courses, the course descriptions, maybe the pathways that students could choose to get to. I learned absolutely nothing. I mean, this is really a disappointment to me that I have to come to a session here, maybe just get a hint of what is really going on in the high school. And this also applies to the other schools too, middle school in particular. Well, uh, in fumbling around with all of this, I ended up going to the state uh, education something or other and got one, a hold of one of their one of their products, uh, ED306, et cetera, and so on. And so I learned that you need 20 credits to get out of here, and I don't think the school has changed that or increased that in any amount. And it takes four credits per year minimum that they have to do. It would take them five years to get out, so anything they can do to make sure they get five credits a year would be important. And then I didn't know how many credit hours were required for each hour, each year credit, and it turns out to be somewhere between 135, 150. So when you talk about sitting in a classroom, there's something to be said about that. 
and then their alternative pathway through the uh, school system. It's the, uh, the document that I downloaded here actually is rather, rather significant in many ways that you have alternative ways to get through the school system. Uh, I also learned that the school has to, have, has to offer 45 credits in various, everything you can think of by this document. And I don't have any idea how this has been implemented, although you had to do it. So really, I was very disappointed to learn nothing from the website. So you want to take this into account for the future if, to carry on this kind of thing. Um, another thing, too, is just the structure of a day's learning. As a comment just to the adjunct of the Concord Tech School, and we've been ongoing for that for many years, it is a drive to get there, I guess. How they organize that, I don't know, but most of the kids at the high school probably have their own cars. So that's something they do on their own. And there's no way we're going to be able to compete against what can go on at the tech school, which is maybe state funded and so forth. And as has already been pointed out, the high school here already has mechanical, uh, has, uh, has tech education opportunities throughout that get the basics in the way. Now going back 30, 40 years, these things were not driven by computers and so on. That's a whole new world that came up since then. And one of the things that I have learned from a young fellow that I know is that there's a huge resource out there in the internet. You can go to YouTube, any place, and you can learn about anything you want to know. If you want to learn how to weave a basket, I think you could find it easily. And the same thing applies to everything else. I remember many years ago when I was sick, one time my mother told me how to knit. <laughs> I don't know how now. So anyways, there's always this hard question of the benefits over the burden of the taxpayers. On the high school upgrade, in 96 uh, we had that bond, has already been spoken of, uh, almost $7 million. And then they added a roof on for 600, almost $700,000 in the early 2000. And then we added another addition to the high school. All of this was for what? At the time, everybody said, and I remember budget committee members talking about, the population was going to the ceiling. It was heading to the, heading to the atmosphere. Well, it didn't happen. So we dropped from about 700 in the high school at that time to uh, 536, I think, was the latest quote. There's a significant drop. The question in my mind is all that space being adequately and properly utilized and so on. I'm not sure that it is, and you need some support to perhaps do that. Undoubtedly, the culinary program is a popular one. And the first question I ask in my mind, don't these kids learn to cook at home? <laughs> you don't have to answer that, it's not a question. So I really don't know what's going on in that regard. But when you have a large overpopulation of things, I ask myself, um, in the fine arts, the state required, I don't know, it was half a credit or something to graduate. Are these, is it the same students taking the same course over and over and over again? I don't know. But these are things that you have to allocate in the resources of the district. You've taken the course, you've passed it, move on. And again, I mentioned uh, a lot of this stuff is learned online. You have all kinds of resources out there to use, and I know the teachers are doing it now. But it ought to be more of a widespread, understood opportunity. And not only do you just learn something online, going to maybe YouTube or something else and getting somebody's opinion, you can go to somebody else. You can go from this site to that site and get all different kinds of opinions. Everybody has a different way of looking at a particular problem, like in physics or something of that order. <clears throat> and then again, you're already doing a lot of things that you've spoken about, so I ask, do you use the space that you currently have as well as you should? And the interdisciplinary skills that you're teaching, you've been doing it for years. It's already been pointed out. There's nothing new here. In uh, my high school time, I learned one program that I remember and used very well, <coughs> mechanical drawing. Nowadays you have CAD drawing, I assume it is, all done by computers. You kind of learn, you kind of lose the skill of using your hands, which probably never had anyways, but that's an opportunity. But again, a lot of that stuff is learned online, as I've had to do when I've uh, had opportunity to do work for somebody else and so forth. Charlie, can I ask, is there any particular question you have of either the municipal uh, budget committee folks or the school board with respect to the project? I, I think I've heard from you a question primarily of whether the space currently is adequately utilized. Is there anything else you'd like to ask them? 
I'm not asking the school board anything, but I'm certainly giving them the point of view of things that they need to think about. Okay, fair enough. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, let's see, local industry. They might have a problem with making a commitment to the high school if they're trying to be helpful if the students think they're gonna be able to tag on to that. Um, that's something that they could do, so. And as far as the uh, model that you put on the uh, board there for the uh, project models and so forth, I mean, that's something you learn quickly anyways when you move into industry. <coughs> on the job training is important. So what basic skills do you need in order to put the student out of the school system and move into a job market where they can have ongoing learning? It, was your, it used to be a model for the school, I don't know if it still exists, but to create lifelong learners. You have it now on the internet, and I mean it's a huge resource. So, one other final thing is uh, the old middle school and the space there where they're using it is to the fullest possible use before you start adding on. And then there's the other question of STEM programs at the middle school and whether that feeds properly into the high school, because that's fundamental. Thank you for your comments, Charlie. I guess I'd ask if anyone wishes to address any of the comments. Yes, Ken, go ahead. So, um, I don't know where you're looking, Charlie, but if you please Google Program of Studies, Kearsarge, up will come your 46-page document that lists the Program of Studies, the graduation requirements, what's required for graduating Kearsarge, what's required in what areas to graduate Kearsarge, and all the different uh, options available for students to choose for courses. So, Kearsarge Program of Studies, and the first thing that comes up you can also do Kearsarge course offerings, and that'll bring up the program of studies. Okay. Sorry, Charlie, it's there, um, but. <laughs> all, right. all right, folks, so we have others that wish to speak to Article One. Uh, well, hold, uh, just before, before you speak, I know you've been up on before. Anyone who has not yet spoken to any of the questions on Article One or comments wish to speak? Yes, come on up. And then we'll let the second round, we'll try and move it through quickly. Go ahead. Thank you, Christine Downing, not a, not a resident of any of the seven towns. But currently, uh, ha I have dual roles. I am the Sutton Central School Principal, and I'm also the Secondary Curriculum Director, so I help oversee curriculum development at both the middle and the high school level. Um, Charlie, I'm more than willing to have a conversation with you about the curriculum development um, across the board. Um, and we are required by law at the high school level to have a program of studies which clearly outlines what we offer um, and how we meet minimum school approval standards, which are New Hampshire Ed Rules 306. Um, I just want to reassure folks that um, as far as this project goes, you know, we have a lot of focus right now on the high school, and I understand that, but this project is something that's great for the district all the way from preschool through our high school classes. Um, and when we talk about STEM education, it is not just a focus at the, the high school level. We have lots of STEM projects and opportunities going on at the middle school level, both during the school day and through extracurricular activities. And I can say the same for our four elementary schools, because for the past three years, my role was <coughs> elementary uh, curriculum coordinator across the four schools. And we have STEM activities that happen a lot in our library media specialist classes. Um, and I also want to do say that project-based learning, just like Andrew Pernard um, indicated, is not something new to this district. Um, right at the elementary level, we actually have a former Krista McCullough winner, uh, Dr. Kristen Lazat, who I have the fortunate of having her as a third grade teacher at Sutton Central School, um, did a whole year sabbatical across this state around project-based learning. Um, so we have lots of opportunities where our curriculum and our instructional practices currently support this. And I think the biggest assessment, and I commend this district for it, is to say, what are the barriers currently? And one of the barriers we know that, that really limit what we're able to do in project-based learning and cross-curriculum conversations are our literal physical facilities. And so I commend the board, I commend the communities for this great effort. And, and for anyone in this audience, and please spread their word, if you want conversations about curriculum, you can reach out to myself. Again, Christine Downing, you can most of the time find me at Sutton Central School. And I'm also gonna get a shout out to my new colleague, Steve Shepard, who as a result of your generous um, budget, uh, approval last year is now the, my counterpart is the elementary curriculum director. So we, we are truly building a cohesive uh, curriculum process here and I see this project 
as just the way that we are gonna go unbelievable. And I wanna remind everybody that one of the key mission components of the Kearsarge Regional School District is that we are an innovative district. We are going to lead the way and we should be really proud of that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else who hasn't spoken on Article One wish to do so? Now is your chance. All right, anybody who has spoken once before wishes to come up again? Now is your chance. One, one other person, come on up. Brown Road Sutton um, obviously the standardized test is a sensitive subject I get it I would recommend that you have some type of measurement that we're improving if you haven't looked at your physical space utilization in this facility I would recommend you go find a manufacturing facility and ask them about their lean activities and Six Sigma activities because the number one excuse that you have in large organizations is you need more space if you standardize and look at how you flow your people here, which are students and teachers, you may find that you have a lot of unused space. Thank and you. You can help yourself. This is an industry standard in all manufacturing. So if you want money, we can give it to you. But if you want space, I challenge you to tell us that you're using all your space effectively. You're probably not. Thank you for your comment, appreciate it. Anyone else wish to speak to Article One? Derek, can I just briefly respond? Oh, sorry, Ken, yes. Yeah, again, this project actually reconfigures the space. It only adds 10% additional space to the high school. So, in fact, it is what, what the problem that we have, really, with regard to the needs of these project-based learning uh, classes is to um, utilize classrooms that were built in the 1970 um, that are just rectangular classrooms um, into an area that actually is meant to flow and meant to provide all the needs that these classes uh, have. So it's not, it's only 10% new space. Thank you. Yes, I will start with you and then we'll go to you and we'll continue on. Joe Cardello, 173 Siemens Road. And just one final question, which by no means I want to put out there as a distraction. I appreciate all the work that's been done. Um, I've been coming to these things, hard to believe, 40 years. Um, so we always get this opportunity once a year to ask questions. Um, I don't always have the luxury of attending all your meetings. Um, hard to believe. Um, that my, my final child will be out of the system next year. And what they'll bring um, from this district, uh, the two different kids, you know, the robotics, the engineering was a, was a big part of it. Uh, my daughter a little bit different, but um, they'll remember their teachers, their administrators. And um, Andrew says he wasn't an athlete. I was an okay, but not great, you know. It's, uh, but the one thing they will remember is, is their athletic uh, endeavors as well. So I, I do have to ask the question just to get an answer. Um, I'm also a numbers guy. Uh, someone, someone said I'm not a numbers person. And so when I do the numbers and I say we're retiring 24 million uh, at 4% at and we're putting in place 22 million at 2.5%, um, I'd like someone uh, just to explain what did go through your um, conversations and deliberative sessions to put this final project together. Um, when and where in that conversation, because I understood it did take place, was there a conversation about perhaps upgrading to turf fields, et cetera? Um, we're doing some good things that need to be done with the athletic program, with the locker rooms. My kids won't get benefit from this, and that, but I just would really like to hear what were those numbers? I mean, we do have the benefit of using a Colby Sawyer College uh, turf field or Proctor Academy affords us that luxury once in a while. Um, but I, I traveled through the state for robotics programs, <laughs> but I traveled through the state for athletic programs too. And, um, you know, we can't have everything we want all the time, but I know that's been bantered around. So can someone speak to how much more that would have affected the bond? Is it something that did really go through your process? 
And is there a timeline for, for that kind of um, project to be addressed? Again, I don't want it to serve as a distraction because I'm very much in favor of the changes you've proposed. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Apparently it is whether you considered a turf field and why it was not included in the bond. Joe, we've, uh, in the facilities committee, we have talked about these proposals. Um, it's probably around a million, million and a half to add a turf field or to replace the current field, the turf field. We've talked about uh, what are the advantages. Is it just a one-time expense or do we also have to think and plan for, you know, what's the life expectancy of that? What are the, the maintenance costs of that? Um, when we planned this STEAM proposal, we tried very hard to, add, to be specific what, we, what we're asking for. Um, there was debate about either the, the athletic locker rooms, whether that should even be included. Um, that was one of the stretch goals that we put in. And I think the decision on the facilities committee, if I remember correctly, was that uh, the turf field is not out of the planning but it's not seen as something we wanted to include in this project to not have a, a distraction, like you said. Um, there is currently no plan or no time plan, but it is, has come up and has, you know, there were some citizens a few years ago that came together and approached the facilities committee, um, whether that could be looked at, planned, funded, um, so that the discussion is ongoing. It's not currently in the, um, capital improvement plan for the next uh, three or four years. Um, but again, I, I think the facilities committee or the board is not going to be shut down to that um, planning that project. And maybe the time when the, when the middle school bond is retired, maybe that'll be something to, to consider at that time as, as doable in the communities. Again, there's a lot of effort in, in, in bringing this forward and the turf field was not one of the things that was in that consideration. Thank you for the answer. Yes. Bob Wright, still in the same place, uh, 67 Blaisdell Hill Road in South Sutton. Um, just a question that we have down here on Article 1 where it reads, are not limited to the New Hampshire Department of Education school building age of approximately 30 percent. Now, there may be a very good chance of getting that. I would, am I, would I be correct in my presumption that if this delayed a year or two years or three years, that 30 percent may not be forthcoming? Thank you for the question. Anyone have a yeah, I can answer that. So back when the middle school was built, there was a system in place for state aid, for school building aid, where it paid for 55%, and we knew that going in. Um, now, uh, school building aid has been on a moratorium since right after the middle school was completed, um, and it is really, I would call it, an ad hoc program. Um, and correct me when I get something wrong, uh, Superintendent, but. Um, you know, 30% is something that could be available. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be available. I would say the chances are not particularly strong, um, but that really depends on what they do in Concord. What will happen if this project is delayed? It's really just a guess, and, I have, and it's not an educated guess either. Um, the building aid situation has changed so dramatically over the past several years um, and continues to change. You know, we, we utilized a lot of state building aid for uh, security enhancement in our district, um, adding the vestibule at the Simon School, um, security cameras, uh, that kind of thing. Um, we were very successful in getting 80% school building aid for those projects, but that was just on security. And that's the problem we have is that there's not any certainty from Concord as to what state building aid is going to be. Because of the long moratorium period, a lot of districts have had very needed projects not be built because they don't have any school building aid. And frankly, they also don't have the resources locally in some towns, um, many towns, to fund those projects themselves. And therefore, there's a backlog of state building projects. And that's why I'm not, to be very fair, I'm not particularly optimistic that we will get a substantial building aid uh, contribution for this project. 
What I do want to assure you, uh, Bob, and, and everybody else, is that we are taking every effort to apply for it. There was a deadline on January 1st for this project to apply and announce that project. We met that deadline and have registered our interest in getting building aid. If this passes in March, there's another deadline July 1st, which we are planning to then concretely ask for a contribution and be eligible for that. I, I second what Ken is saying that um, given a 12-year moratorium on building aid across the state, uh, a lot of, of pent-up need is there that uh, will need to be weighed by people in Concord. Thank you for the question and the comments. Any other uh, members of the public wish to speak? All right. Come on up. Charlie Forsberg. <coughs> Sorry about that. Charlie Forsberg. <coughs> Rather disgusting. I, met, I have a simple question. I want somebody to define robotics to me. We hear this an awful lot. I know what it is. And I have my own definition, but I want to hear from somebody else, and then we'll make such comment as needed. Need. Thank you. Anyone wants to answer that question? Yes, sir. Mike, the site assistant superintendent. So uh, from a curricular perspective, robotics is a program that's run as an extracurricular activity. It's usually tied to some of the activities that we do in coordination with New Hampshire FIRST programming. Uh, it's a competitive series that they run throughout the state and often also actually nationally as well. But beyond that, we also integrate into robotics programming, things like CAD design, mechanical design programs, mechanical engineering <coughs> programs. There's discussion in the curricula about the potential of adding bioengineering and biomechanical design programming. So all those are the elements of a quote unquote robotics background. Does that help? Well, probably. I'm going to make a rather simple definition of it, though. I'm going to start with sensors which is a huge subject in itself and extremely important, then maybe transducers, and then actuators, and then some kind of software that ties all this stuff together, and that pretty much goes to what he just said. Charlie, do you have a question? And all the question then becomes, and I'll leave this to you to answer any way you want, how much learning is involved in this as opposed to entertainment? Thank you for the comment. Uh, with that, I would like to, uh, it, it appears we've had a very robust debate and a very good discussion. I would entertain a motion uh, for the uh, adoption of Article 1. Do I have anyone that wishes to move for adoption of Article 1? So we'll actually, Go I have ahead. a question for our yes. council. Yes, council. Do we actually vote or does the charter require that the article be placed on the ballot regardless of? Deliberate? I'll let you speak to that. The charter requires it to go on the ballot, but certainly I think what this meeting has done in the past is it's voted either to close debate and move on to the next article or to place the article, uh, many districts vote to place the article on the ballot as written in the warrant. So either way is but proper. It, but, but it'll happen regardless of the vote here. It will happen no matter what, yes. The charter, <laughs> the charter requires it. <laughs> well, fair enough. With that explanation, I guess what I would do is like to entertain a motion to put the, uh, the Article 1 on the ballot. Do I hear such a motion? Uh, yes, Emilio Canciobello. And is there a second? Bob Wright. Bob Wright. Um, any further discussion? Having heard none, uh, all in favor of putting Article 1 on the ballot as written, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Article 1 is going to be put on the ballot one way or the other. Good discussion, folks. Um, with, with that, I'd like to move on to Article 2, which is the actual operating budget uh, for the school district. And I understand that uh, uh, Board Chair Ken Bartholomew is going to speak to Article 2. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you. Article 2 is to see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate the Municipal Budget Committee's recommended, recommended amount of $47,172,492 for the support of schools, for the payment of salaries for the school district officials and agents, and for the payment of the statutory obligations of the district. Uh, the school board recommends the same number, $47,172,492. This article does not include appropriations voted on in other warrant articles. This warrant asks the voters to raise and appropriate for the support of schools, the salary of school district officials and agents, and for the statutory obligations of said district, and to authorize the application 
against said appropriation of such sums as are estimated to be received from the state sources together with other income, the school board to certify to the selectmen in East, each of the towns of Bradford, New London, Newbury, Springfield, Sutton, Warner, and Wilmot, the amount to be raised by taxation by said towns. This was recommended by the school board eight to nothing and recommended by the municipal budget committee eight to nothing. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to article two in the public have questions or comments about it? So I have an explanation that I'll give Derek. Go ahead. Okay. So the 2022-23 operating budget proposed by this, the regional school board and the municipal budget committee of 47,172,492 is an increase of approximately $829,197 or 1.79% from last year's or this current year's budget. The areas of increase within the school board's operating budget are a result of a variety of factors that are explained in the following paragraphs. In summary, the majority of the budget increases this year falls into two categories, wages and health benefits. Those two items alone account for 945, 922, or 116,725 more than the total budget increase of 829,197. Uh, I'll go through those as quickly as I can. Uh, wages and fringe. The requested budget for 22-23 re re reflects a net increase of 2.8 teacher FTEs, or full-time equivalents. Added our one FTE for an elementary school teacher due to class size projections at Bradford, and one FTE for an elementary reading specialist at New London Elementary School, which also has seen a large increase in uh, size. Additional FTEs are as follows, 0.1 FTE for secondary culinary, 0.4 for secondary drama, 0.2 for secondary art, and 0.1 for elementary math. And that, you know, when you have point FTEs, what that does is increases the amount of time, usually, of someone who's already working for the district. Uh, in addition, 1.5 FTE custodians were added for the middle school and our new professional development center in New London, the former um, middle school. As a result, the wage line for employees requires an increase of approximately $375,499, or 45.28% of the budget increase. The actual increase in the health benefit costs was a 10.1% increase from the current 21-22 health effective rates. Uh, based on this increase, health benefits alone represent 68.8% of the total budget increase, or $570,423. Included under other payroll benefits are dental, life, long-term disability, workers' comp insurance, taxes, workshop, and tax-sheltered annuities. The overall other payroll benefit increase represents 13.15% of the total budget, or $109,066. The state retirement account this year increased 4.35%, or $36,069. So the big hit this year really was health insurance which has been much more reasonable in past years, but we didn't get so lucky this year. Uh, out of district costs. Uh, our out of district costs for 22-23 are estimated to be a reduction of $30,000 or point, minus 3.62% of the budget at this point in time. Each year out of district special education costs are very fluid and driven by a variety of factors that include the ability of our local staff to meet the needs of intensive behaviorally or medically challenged students, families who move into or out of the district, and the costs associated with delivering highly specialized services in environments outside the district whose costs keep rising. We make every attempt in the district to meet each child's needs in the least restrictive educational environment at the local level, but there are times when the child's special needs exceed our local capacity to meet them. In addition, federal law requires us to provide those needs until the age of 21. And starting at the age of three and a half? Three. Three. Um, placements for out of district services can range from $50,000 per student to upwards of $300,000 per student, depending on the residential requirements. Uh, other operating costs included in this area are textbooks, technologies, contracted services, supplies, repairs, equipment, capital improvement, new improvement, furniture, dues and fees, printing, telephone, copiers, assessment, and others. Uh, these are the things that we debate most of all because they have, we have more control over those at the local level. Those costs re reflect a decrease of approximately 39.38% or $326,575. Uh, other expenses, 
Transportation represents an $8.54 or $70,839 budget increase. That's a contracted service. Utilities, bonds, property uh, insurance budget increased by approximately 10.78% or 89,414. Food service represents an increase of budget of 0.28% or $2,329. Federal funds represent a decrease of 8.18% or $67,867,000 of the decrease. Note all federal dollars appropriated are offset by federal matching funds, so the result has no effect on the local tax rate. And then if you look in your package, you'll see a chart um, that separates the uh, budget uh, amount into its different categories, wage and fringe general fund being the largest by far. And then you also see uh, another chart that shows, that takes the increase of 1.79% and indicates where those increases or decreases are in the different um, categories. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Now I'd like to entertain uh, comments from the public. Yes, sir, come on up. Andrew Pinard, 12 Church Street. Once again, I'd like to applaud the efforts of the Municipal Budget Committee, the school board, the administrators, our teachers, and the support staff within the district. My biggest concern associated with this budget and the article to follow is we are all hearing uh, reports of excessive amounts of teachers leaving the industry uh, and the difficulties in hiring um, substitute teachers and other support staff to make sure that we have adequate staffing. Uh, frankly, adequate staffing is not enough uh, for the educational needs of our students. So, I would just like somebody to speak to that there is a level of confidence in this, and I'm sure we'll hear about it in the following article, that we have enough to meet the uh, anticipated needs to uh, recruit uh, new staff to fill the positions and to retain those positions once filled. Thank you for your other question. Anyone wish to speak to that? Well, I'll take that and then jump in anybody else. Uh, there is no doubt that the COVID crisis has had a very detrimental effect on uh, recruitment in, in general about people willing to or able to work for the school district uh, and other industries. Uh, we have seen a, a, you know, an impact in terms of um, numbers of applicants for jobs advertised. Uh, one good example is that this year we probably have a record number of uh, teachers and staff that are not yet fully certified or, or add a certification that we need um, through alternative uh, credentialing programs for the state. Um, we have currently, I believe, eight uh, individuals that are engaged in learning while they are teaching. Um, that, is, that is more than what we had in the past. I think application numbers, uh, even for elementary school uh, positions, uh, are significantly down. We are still in a position where we, by and large, can fill our positions, except for our substitute teachers. Uh, we have a handful of substitutes for the whole district. I want to commend our teachers in all of our schools. For the last two years, they have just uh, offered yeoman's work. They cover for each other when people are required to stay home due to COVID or, or COVID on their families, impact on their kids. Um, we've tried to create a safe environment for those teachers and students that are in the schools so that we do not lose more people um, through our action. Uh, we have been successful with that. I'm very proud of that. The board has taken a strong leadership position there in, in setting a standard. Um, we have, we have teachers that go above and beyond on a daily basis. Um, when 10, 12, 14 staff members are out at a high school or middle school, that puts an inordinate amount of stress on those schools. Um, so far, we have been able to, to meet the need. Um, but, I mean, it would be an illusion to assume that if a physics teacher or a English teacher is out, and someone with a math or a uh, PE background has to cover that class that the same level of, of instruction can be assured. Uh, I think we're in crisis times. We are in, in times where uh, all decks on hand is necessary and we will get through this the best we can. We have a wonderful staff. 
We have wonderful administrators, uh, custodians. Everybody puts their efforts together um, to cover classes and, and get the best education to our kids. It's undeniably a, a negative effect on, on the, the, the school, the district, and the state, and the profession. Did you want to speak to this question? Mike the South Assistant Superintendent. Um, I appreciate Mr. Bernard's question because I think it's, it's, a, it's obviously where we need to be thinking is are we, are we able to attract and retain the staff members that we need to do the jobs within our district? The one thing that I would say is, is that the board has been extremely um, thoughtful and our unions have been extremely um, thoughtful as well in trying to make sure that we can benefit each other uh, through compensation, through different means of, of trying to, to support the staff that we already have. But I will say this, if we are gonna move forward through this crisis and where it is a crisis, it's a hiring crisis, the only way that we're going to be able to do this is if our communities within the seven towns start to really seriously consider how they can work with schools and, um, and the community itself to develop housing um, and daycare services um, that will support bringing youthful teachers into the community that want to stay. Because right now there is no capacity within our seven towns to find affordable housing in our region that a single young professional can actually have. A $45,000 salary for a starting teacher will not cut it. You cannot find housing in our area uh, that supports that and the cost of daycare. We have teachers who are moving uh, 50, 60 miles away and commuting uh, to work and we lose those people not because they don't want to be a part of this wonderful community, it's because they can't afford to stay or they can't get here in the first place. So there has to be some sort of coordinated support between those entities. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wish to speak to Article 2? Yes, come on up. Sarah Anderson, Springfield, New Hampshire. Um, I just, again, I'm not a numbers person, and I do, one of my, my big concerns is that um, we, like everyone, we won't be able to retain the, the teachers and the staff that we have. Um, I think Kearsarge hires and employs some of the best educators that, that are available in the state. Um, and so for me, and it may, this may have been answered already so forgive me I'm kind of a simpleton when it comes to things but um, everyone is looking for wage increases I was just reading about Chicago teachers who went on strike and um, didn't go into the classroom and I, I think we are extremely fortunate in this community that our our teachers have not done that although I may be one who would support them if they did um, because I have seen firsthand what the um, educators have done above and beyond what they um, they probably get paid for. Um, so my question, and I probably just need a basic yes or no, is there money in the budget if we were, were in a situation suddenly in the middle of the year where we needed to offer our teachers and paras um, more, more money? Because I think it's, it's a reality that people are looking for, um, especially trying to stay in this community because prices have gone up and it's hard to get affordable homes. Does the district have the ability to do that without asking the community for, for more money another time? I'm not sure if my Th question makes sense. No, thanks for your question. Let's see if anybody wants to take a crack at answering it. The next article is addressing exactly that issue. We, we sat with our teachers over the summer and the fall. We had difficult negotiations, obviously, but we have in the end come through with a proposal to the communities to provide exactly that uh, acknowledgement and also that, that safety and stability for our teachers as well as the communities through a new teacher contract. Um, there was, the, the paraprofessionals will come up this upcoming summer for another agreement, uh, hopefully. Um, the board has in the past addressed that issue head on and in fact, um, this budget uh, when we, um, built it on initially, we looked at um, a 3% increase for all non-union uh, employees, custodians and, and, and others. Um, and the board really asked the question, is that enough, given what the, the wage competition is out there? And uh, then uh, that led to an adjustment to, to up that to 3.5%. 
it, it may not seem like you know enough, but we are also a, a public entity, and I would say that we as a district, in my experience, always provide an added value through maybe not always tangible financial rewards, but uh, the benefit structure is very, very favorable. And also people like to work here because they, they have a board and they have a, an MBC and, and, the, and seven communities that appreciate their input. I think of the, the March through June 2020 when we had to shut down our schools. The, the public acknowledgement of what our teachers and the education system do for their kids uh, was phenomenal. We heard from so many people that they appreciated what we did in that shutdown. And then the full year after, where our schools were open and where, teachers, uh, where parents and kids had opportunities to choose how they felt safest in their instruction. And a majority stayed in school, others were at home, and our teachers taught all of them. And I think did an outstanding job that was recognized, I think, throughout the state and certainly throughout our communities. It doesn't, it doesn't go unnoticed that there are teachers in Paris who stand outside New London Elementary School freezing in very cold weather just to keep our kids safe and educated and um, it's greatly appreciated. I just want to make sure that they get the best compensation we can offer them. Thank you for your comment and the response. Anyone else wish to speak to Article 2? We're talking about the operating budget. Going once, going twice. Yes, Charlie, come on up. Uh, Charlie Forsberg, I'm Sutton. Last year, I believe I raised the question, the school board presented the annual budget. And now I'm reading on the first line that the Municipal Budget Committee is presenting the annual budget. And I'm wondering, how did we change the charter to see that this happened? This is a question for Barbara Lohman, a school district attorney. <laughs> well, Council, excuse me. Well, I, I think we'll have Barbara come up if you wish to answer the question. But then we'll turn back to Article 2 very quickly. Yeah. Well, it's on, the, it's on the ballot. I mean, only, uh, well, Charlie, I, I, th I think it's clear from looking at the warrant <coughs> article that both figures are in the warrant article. And there's no problem under the charter with this. Well, had they been different numbers, would they see the same order as we see now? Same numbers. Well, I'm not going to speculate on that. I okay. don't know. Okay, okay. The question then is, do we believe in equal opportunity? Is this something that has pervaded all of us in our thinking and so forth across the nation? We're hearing about it all the time. And if that be the case, don't you think that when you get a ballot in your hand, the official ballot, and there are special stipulations to the official ballot that you should be able to answer up or down every question that occurs on that ballot, regardless of what it is. And is that the case here in this district? No. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else wish to speak to Article 2, the operating budget? Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I would entertain a motion uh, to uh, move forward and approve Article 2 for placing on the ballot Anybody so moved? Mr. Bobo, right? Yeah. Thank you. And a second? Thank you. It's hard to read behind you. Perfect. Uh, I have a first and a second. Any further comment? In that case, I'd like to call the question on Article 2, the operating budget. All in favor of Article 2 being placed on the ballot, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. With that, Article 2 passes, and we're moving on to Article 3. Article 3 relates to the collective bargaining agreement, and I believe Allison Mastin is going to speak to that. Allison, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, good morning, Allison Mastin. I'm the vice chair of the board and a representative from the town of Wilmot. Article 3, to see if the school district will vote to approve the cost item included in the collective bargaining agreement reached between the Kearsarge Regional School Board and Kearsarge Regional Educators Association, which calls for the following increases in salaries and benefits. In the year 2022-2023, the estimated increase will be $432,569. In the year 2023-2024, 
the estimated increase will be $464,065. In the year 2024-2025, the estimated increase will be $449,900. And further, to raise and appropriate the sum of $432,569 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increases in salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at current staffing levels. The school board recommends 8-0. The Municipal Budget Committee recommends 8-0. Now I'm gonna read the school board explanation. The school board and the Kearsarge Regional Educators Association have reached an agreement on a three-year contract for 2022 through 2025. The proposed agreement continues to provide modest but competitive salary increases and benefits for teachers and specialists covered under the collective bargaining agreement, otherwise termed the CBA. The projected three-year total cost to the district for this contract remains in line with the previous two agreements, thus providing fiscal stability and predictable labor costs for the school district. The contract continues to lower the district's contribution costs to health insurance premiums from 94% to 92%. Additionally, it introduces two lower cost insurance plan options for our educators, including an incentive plan for staff to switch to those lower cost options. The new CBA introduces two three-year pilot programs to address the ongoing shortage of substitute teachers and the difficulty hiring qualified educators in specialty areas such as math, science, and special education. Newly hired teachers, teachers will receive a paid one-day non-instructional teacher orientation session prior to the start of the school year. And I just want to say I, I was part of those negotiations and I want to thank and commend the KREA um, they were long, difficult negotiations, but I think everybody reached an agreement that everybody was pleased with, and it was, I'm, I'm happy to be, represent the board in, in, during those negotiations, and I think we all came out um, pretty well in that. So. Thank you very much for the explanation. Anyone uh, wish to speak to Article 3, the KERA Collective Bargaining Agreement? Yes, Charlie. It was raised earlier, a rather, a rather valid question. <clears throat> so I'm gonna generalize the question in this order. And I'm not sure it's germane specifically to this article, but the school board is gonna to have to think about it. And as providing some additional funding, I call it living assistance for those that you would want to bring into the district. It's math, sciences, whatever. <clears throat> And they can't really find a suitable place to live based upon the salary, whether they can get an addenda to that salary uh, for a period of time in order to establish themselves somewhere to reside in the district. Now, that's just a, it might be a rhetorical question, but I'm just wondering if that's something you could think about. Thank you for raising the point. Anybody else wish to comment or have a question about Article 3, the Collective Bargaining Agreement? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to uh, move forward with Article 3 and pass it for uh, inclusion on the March ballot. Yes, Emilio, and a second. <laughs> we'll have Ms. Maston. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor of Article 3, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Article 3 is passed, and we now move on to Article 4, which is a net assessment retention. In just a moment, uh, Ms. Bates will be speaking to this. I understand that this item is discussed and voted on here today, and because it is not a monetary uh, warrant article, it will not appear on the ballot in March. The decision that we make today is the decision that will ultimately uh, pass the, uh, the warrant. So with that, on Article 4, uh, Ms. Bates, would you like to speak to that? Article 4, shall the district adopt the revisions to RSA 198-4-B, Roman numeral 2, enacted in 2020, which allows the district to authorize indefinitely until rescinded to retain up to 5% of the district's net assessment in any year, allows the expenditure of any amount retained after the school board first holds a public hearing, and requires the school board to include an annual reporting of the retained fund balance in its annual report to the district. 
School board recommends eight to zero. NBC recommends eight to zero. The school board explanation, if approved, this article would allow the district to retain up to 5% of remaining funds on hand at the end of its fiscal year. Any expenditure of these funds will first need a public hearing held by the school board and will also require it being posted in the district annual report. Thank you. Is there anybody that wishes to have further explanation of Article 4 from the Board of the Municipal Budget Committee? If not, I'll turn it over to the audience. Yes, sir. Andrew Pinard, 12 Church Street, Bradford. A number of years ago, the voters of this district were asked to approve an emergency funding uh, amount. I believe it was up to 8%. Um, that was for use for emergency use that had to be approved by the DR, uh, by the Department of Education. And we actually utilized, well, we intended to utilize those funds at one point and applied for, but then we were able to pay for from within district. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I would ask what is the difference between these two uh, other than the fact that with this negates the need to go uh, forward to the Department of Education for approval. And also, uh, if you can give an example of some of the projects that this funding uh, might, uh, might be used for. And I assume that this, should we approve it here at the deliberative session, this is 5% of any particular year. So this is not an, a, an accumulating amount. It is not to exceed 5%. Thank you for your questions. Who wishes to speak to that? Okay. Uh, Andrew, the, the uh, current fund is at 2.5%. That's the legal limit. It's not 8%, it's 2.5%. In fact, towns have much higher percentages of, of retention uh, that they have under that law. This is essentially an update to the law that led to the 2.5% allowance for school, board, uh, school districts. Uh, the legislature found it prudent to uh, enable districts to retain up to 5% instead of the, having the limit of 2.5%. We have 25 on the books. The board felt it was important to give voters a choice, or the deliberative session a choice, to increase that. As you said, we have not, uh, we have tried once to utilize 2.5%. We're then uh, fortunate enough to have it in the, in the, in the surplus uh, for that project and did not utilize it. It was, I believe, for the, uh, the change in the upgrade to the septic system at the high school. So this would, inst this would just authorize the, the school board to go possibly up to 5%. It's not, it hasn't have to spend 5%, but go instead, have a limit instead of 2.5%, not 5%. And th this would not increase the amount that the district retains to 5%. It just would allow it to do so if it uh, voted to do so, if the board voted to do so um, at a later date. And could someone speak to the question about cumulative 5%? Yeah, it's not, it's not cumulative. <laughs> so it happens once, uh, but then it's adjusted as the change in the uh, net assessment changes. Thank you. Uh, further question or comment? Yes, I'm just, again, following up because I'm trying to clarify for my own uh, interest. So is this in addition to or replacing the two and a half percent, and thank you for correcting that it's, number. It's, and secondly, is there a reason there's no language in here other than the public hearing that the Municipal Budget Committee, I know it's not uh, a normal process and the one that we have established by charter uh, with the MBC having input into this, and I presume that they will have input during the public hearing, but is there, if, if it could be spoken to as to why there was no mention of the Municipal Budget Committee's participation in that. Uh, I guess I'll let the board answer. I do see the NBC recommending eight to zero. So I, no, no, I, my point is on the expenditure of funds from uh, if approved. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. So I guess the question is, um, w why is the NBC not included in the distribution of those funds if they're ultimately distributed? Yeah, it's, it's not part of the statute, right? Yeah, so I think the answer to the question from council and from the, uh, the, the table is that that's not allowed and permitted by statute, so they're merely becoming in alignment with state statute. That's the answer. Anyone else have any questions or comments with respect to uh, Article 4, the net assessment retention? Seeing none, I'll entertain. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Charlie. Well, resident, there was a question raised as whether the 2.5% disappears with this 5%. And I do recall that the district did, in fact, vote uh, maybe 10 years ago to uh, retain 2.5% which this year would be about $1.18 million. 
to be increased up to two point three and a half million dollars. Um, so I want that, that should be clarified, that it is replacing the original two and a half percent and it's not two and a half plus five. Correct. Okay. I offer a, a motion to amend the article. Oh, I know, you don't want to, well, we got time. Well, tell me what your motion is. All right, the motion is very simple and that's just to follow up with this fellow here that just spoke, <coughs> to add the Municipal Budget Committee to the, to the, uh, to the article. And it would read as such as I have written it here to the school board, et cetera, would the Municipal Budget Committee first hold a public hearing? And I have copies here to be passed out. Uh, go ahead. Thank you for offering the amendment. Let me confer with council to see if we're allowed to do it given that it is not consistent with state statute. Give us one moment, please. Go ahead if you want to speak to, to the public. I think you could add that in parentheses after the article, something to the effect the school board will um, submit the proposal to the budget committee if you want, but it's not consistent with the statute. So I do not think that you should add that to the body of the warrant article. Well, I strongly disagree, only because town meeting forms of government have a lot of latitude of how they modify and construct or change any article that comes before them, as long as the original purpose is retained. <clears throat> we have other lawyers I'm probably in the audience here, so one can, can work on that, and Barbara Lohman, uh, I think, would probably accept that as the rule of law. So, so my article here just goes to changing and adding in that the budget committee shall be present at the public hearing. So thank you for offering. Before we go any further, I want to find out if there is a second on the motion to amend. Yes, uh, Bob Wright, you second the motion to commend. Amend. So what I'd like to do is entertain now any discussion on the motion to amend Article 4, Article 5, uh, sorry, Article 4 with respect to the net assessment retention. And let me read, bear with me one second. Let me read, if I can, the proposed amendment so everybody knows what we are discussing. The motion on the floor to amend Article 4 would state that uh, the article to be amended to include the Regional School District Municipal Budget Committee involvement in the expenditure of funds retained by the authority. So we would be inserting the words with the Municipal Budget Committee into the language. So here's how it would read, everybody follow along. Article four, shall the district adopt and re the revisions to RSA 198 colon 4-B, Roman numeral two, enacted in 2020, which allows the district to authorize indefinitely until rescinded to retain up to 5% of the district's net assessments in any year, allows the expenditure of any amount retained after the school board with the municipal budget committee first holds a public hearing and requires the school board to include an annual reporting of the retained fund balance in its annual report to the district. That is the motion uh, to amend on the table. We are now having discussion on the motion to amend, which has been seconded. Does anybody else wish to speak to the motion to amend? Sir. Yes, I'd like to appreciate the correction. Uh, the 8% was the $800,000 that we actually originally uh, retained from the 2.5%, so I appreciate the correction. Um, I do want to express that I believe that the school board uh, in its current constitution and in past constitutions have been very collaborative with the Municipal Budget Committee, which has also had the same type of relationship, and I think they've been very respectful in terms of notification. And my question that perhaps prompted this amendment um, was more as a matter of whether or not that is an appropriate form of action within our district. So I recognize the fact that the statute may not uh, require specific language that does not include the Municipal Budget Committee because not every district has one. Um, but I, I believe that the practice of the school board in the current, uh, not the modified, not the proposed amended version, but the original one, would the practice would likely be continued to include the Municipal Budget Committee in that. The only question I would have is school boards and Municipal Budget Committees change year to year. And so whether it's something we wish to adopt as a practice I, I think that I will likely not support the amendment in the way it's currently worded, but I just wanted to make sure and express the fact that I think it is important to recognize that both the MBC and the school board do work very collaboratively together. 
Thank you for your comment. Anybody else wish to speak to the amendment? Again, the amendment would essentially say that before the school board could expend any of those funds that are held back, they would have to hold a meeting with the Municipal Budget Committee in order to expend those funds. So that's the amendment on the floor. Any further discussion? Yes, Bob. I made a sec, Bob Wright, uh, Blaisdell, same place, Blaisdell Lake Road, South Sutton. Uh, I, I made the, I second the amendment because I thought it would be important for discussion. My question is, is that it is outside the normal RSA wording. And my, my question is, is can we be more, I'll say, uh, protective of the public, or is it a rather, um, how we would use the word, not necessary? And, and I, 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 I wanted to kind of have that fleshed out. What's the legal, what is the advantage of this amendment, because you have two parties, but what are the legal ramifications that I wonder if our attorney would share that with us? Fair enough. I'll ask her to come speak to the question. I'm not sure she can give a legal opinion off the cuff, but let's see if, which, what you can offer. Well, all I can tell you is that the language uh, in the warrant is the language that is recommended by the Department of Revenue Administration. Uh, however, this is a statute that does not have mandatory language. You know, some statutes say the question shall be X, Y, Z. Uh, this does not. So it's not entirely clear to me um, uh, that there would necessarily be a problem with this amendment. My suggestion was that you, to avoid the risk of this not being considered valid, uh, you could put that language in parentheses after the warrant article, which means it would not be part of the article, uh, but nonetheless, um, it would still be something that had been voted on and that people uh, agreed should be there. So either way. All right, with that, any further discussion on the proposed amendment to article number four? If not, I'm going to call the question. All in favor of the proposed amendment to article four say aye. aye. All opposed say no. 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 The no's have it. We are now back to a discussion with Article 4 as proposed by the school board and the MBC. Any further discussion on Article 4 as proposed in the packet of materials you have today? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Who uh, wishes to uh, move for the approval of Article 4 and be having it placed on the ballot uh, for our Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, that's right. I'm using my old language. That's incorrect. Who is, approve, who is in favor of approving Article 4 here today, which will not be placed on the ballot at the town meeting? All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? The article passes. We need a motion and a second. For the oh, I may have uh, overstepped my bounds. First, let me make sure we handle this correctly procedurally. My apologies. Do I have a motion to approve in, uh, Article 4? Let me have that first. Yes, Mr. Bobroff in the back. And do I have a second? Mr. Kencio Bello. Now, let me try again. All in favor of Article 4 as now before us say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you for your patience and letting us get through it. Now let's move to Article Number Five. Article Five deals with the Special Education Expendable Trust Fund, and I understand Mr. Cushing is going to speak to this. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Cushing, a school board rep from New London. I know we do have some Kearsarge grads in the uh, s the audience today, but I'd like to recognize my buddy Luke Gorman and I as two Kearsarge grads that sit up here. Uh, on the Municipal Budget Committee and the School Board. <laughs> Luke obviously graduated a lot sooner ago than I did, <laughs> obviously. But uh, we both are uh, very proud uh, graduates of this school. Uh, Article 5, to see if the school district will vote to raise an appropriate up to $25,000 to be placed in the Special Education Expendable Trust Fund established in 2008 within the provisions of RSA 198 20-C for the purpose of emergency funding of unforeseen special education costs incurred by the district with such amount to be funded from unassigned fund balance 
surplus funds remaining on hand as of June 30th, 2022. The school board recommended this article eight to zero and the municipal budget committee recommended it eight to zero as well. The school board explanation in 2008, the voters established an expendable trust fund for the purpose of providing funds for unforeseen emergency circumstances in special education that may arise in a year after the budget has been adopted. If approved, this article will add up to $25,000 to that fund from operating surplus remaining on hand as of June 30th, 2022. The balance of this fund as of July 31st, 2021 is approximately $336,035 with the target amount to be raised of $372,139. Thank you for that explanation. Is there anyone that has any questions or comments from the public with respect to Article 5, the Special Education Trust Fund? Yes. Liz Tentarelli, Newbury. I'm wondering how the allocation of funds to this fund would be impacted by the warrant article that we just talked about. Thank you for the question. Who might wish to speak to the question? That's an uh, interesting question. Um, so uh, if there were a need for a large expenditure um, for uh, special education that wasn't in the current year's budget, um, the, dis the, the school board would have to make a choice as to whether to try to utilize money in the trust fund uh, or try to use some of this surplus uh, funding. Um, I can't speak to what we would decide <laughs> or a majority of us would decide. My thinking on it would be we have a special trust fund available for this particular expenditure. I would certainly think that it would make more sense to use that specific trust fund to solve that budget shortfall um, before going to a more generalized amount, um, which is the 5%. Uh, if, if it is 5%, it's still 2.5% until the, the board votes to change that. Um, so I guess that would be my statement, but I don't think there's a legal, I'm not, I don't see in the statute that there's a legal reason that we couldn't utilize the 5% first. Although when we applied for using this money from this excess before, um, they said we couldn't because we had money in surplus. So, <laughs> you know, you've, you use, you try to redistribute the money you have already budgeted first before dipping into either trust funds or a, a retained amount. That makes perfect sense. But once you don't, if you don't have the op, that first option, then I don't, I think it's the discretion of the board as to which uh, other option you choose. Thank you for the question and the explanation. Anyone else have any questions or comments with respect to Article 5, the Special Education Expendable Trust Fund? Yes, Charlie. Well, the interesting question was raised as to the order of priority as far as money's coming out of these trust funds that we have in next surplus and so on. So that's an interesting question. Has any money been spent out of this trust fund relative to Article 5? in the past year or in the past two or three years? I mean, what has been the drawdown from the right, from the upside? Thank you for the question. Can How anyone- money spent out of the Special Education Trust Fund in the last two or three years? Thank just, you. Just, there I'll has just, not been any money spent out of this in the last two or three years. And, and I'll just go back. You know, the reason this trust fund, as I recall, was first um, created, and it was before my time on the board, just, just before my time on the board, was that, there was a, a problem with uh, special education expenditures during the year dr rising dramatically, and there was, did have to be a special meeting called an additional appropriation made at that time. So in a response to that, I believe this trust fund was created to help solve that problem. And as you, as you heard earlier, you know, a single move into the district for an out-of-district placement can run as much as $300,000, which would pretty much take up almost all of of this, uh, this uh, trust fund. Any further questions? Go ahead. Kind of a rhetorical question, but, and the money's invo involved here insignificant, but if you had a question of not having enough money surplus, which comes first? Five, six, five, and then four? I don't know. That's up to the, that's up to the, to the uh, school board. 
Right. Well, thank you for the comment. Any further discussion on Article 5, the special, special Education Trust Fund? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve Article 5 and to place it on the ballot for the March meetings. So moved. I heard it over here first. Thank you. And second? Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright, thank you. All in favor of Article 5, uh, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Article 5 passes. With that, we turn to Article 6. Article 6 deals with the School Building Maintenance Fund. And I understand uh, Eric Grigori is going to speak to that. Did I get the name correctly? Close enough. Thank Good you. morning. Uh, my name is Eric Gregoire. I'm the school board representative for the town of Bradford. <clears throat> Article 6, to see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate up to $35,000 to be placed in the school building's maintenance expendable trust fund for the purpose of repair unanticipated utility costs and maintaining the school buildings and equipment with such amount to be funded from unassigned fund balance, surplus funds, remaining on hand as of June 30th, 2022. School board recommends 8-0, NBC recommends 8-0. Our school board explanation, in 2009, the voters established an expendable trust fund for the purpose of repairs, unanticipated utility costs, and maintaining school buildings and equipment. If approved, this article was set, will set aside up to $35,000 towards that purpose from operating surplus funds remaining on hands as of June 30th, 2022. The balance of the fund as of July 31st, 2021 is approximately $466,733. The target amount to be raised is $500,236. Thank you for the explanation. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> Excuse me or comment on Article 6. Yes, sir. Um, Bob Wright again. Do you want to hear it all? Just from Sutton. We understand, <laughs> Bob. Sutton. Thank you. <clears throat> this harkens back to number one because there was a trust fund practically in there. And when I say trust fund, I'm talking CR. And I know it's treated differently. <clears throat> But if we are doing a major reno, which means improvements, is any of this money being set aside on behalf of the, of the STEAM project? And if not, why not? Thank you for the question. Uh, who on the panel would like to answer? Happy <laughs> Go ahead, you're up. Um, this speaks to unanticipated funds, was a comment from the NBC. So, for example, when we had the oil, um, our oil uh, tanks that needed double walls, and that state law came into effect in January, we were forced to do this. We didn't have that budgeted. That's when we recently used uh, that trust fund to pay for that expense. And that's what we're filling up again with these. Uh, add-on funds. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Yes, Charlie. You use the word target amount. Now, is there a maximum amount that you feel you don't need to ask the voters for more money if you reach that and it's stable? Uh, anyone wish to yep, speak to that I'll question? speak to that. So I'm uh, on the Finance and Audit Committee, and at our, just our last meeting, which was um, Thursday, um, we took up the question of what the target amounts should be for the different district trust funds. Um, and, you know, with consultation with administration, we try to figure out what a reasonable amount would be. I think a better example is the, you know, the, um, the prior one, which is, you know, uh, we wanted a, an amount that would cover what we think would be the maximum amount of uh, unexpected out of district placement in the, uh, that would had to occur um, that isn't budgeted for and of course you can't budget for someone moving in that you don't even know <laughs> what the future will hold the same applies really for building and maintenance repairs um, back in 2000 the board decided that they didn't think that a building and maintenance that you know the, the roof was the roofs were the issue so they created the roof fund so this really is separate from the roof fund I would say 
um, although we could theoretically use this money for roof repair I again think that you'd want to go to the specific trust fund for that first and about half a million dollars was the decision based on a consultation with uh, administration that we thought would be a comfortable number to have for unanticipated repairs increased utility costs etc so with if you know if this passes and there's sufficient money in surplus to fund it um, this will reach the goal um, and we will not come back and ask for more uh, unless that for some reason we want to increase that target uh, or um, we expend money from it and need to replace it thank you for the question and the explanation is there any further question or comment with respect to article 6 the school buildings maintenance fund yes hi Susan Knight uh, from South Sutton again uh, so did I did I hear you say that there's a roof fund? Yes. So are there actual funds set aside for anticipated maintenance costs? So there, there is a roof trust fund of, that has about $800,000 in it. Uh, we, uh, we did decide at the Finance and Audit Committee that that needs to be reevaluated because that was a number that was come up with 20 years ago. Um, and we don't know if it's a reasonable number anymore. Um, so why are we not adding funds uh, this year to that? Because that's the target amount. And that's why we don't have a reason to add it because we haven't looked yet at whether that needs more money in it. But you are uh, evaluating whether or yes. not it should be increased? Yes. Because that was... And, that and was are there, it, I'm sorry. Are there other um, funds in place for anticipated maintenance needs like HVAC or heating? That would be this fund, uh, Article 6. But you, I mean, you have to be aware that in 10 or 20 years that heating systems are going to be upgraded. So sure, right. Although, you know, what, what should happen in the best of circumstances are, is that um, maintenance, need, maintenance is put on the capital improvement plan and it gets included into the budget uh, as capital costs. So the trust funds are really meant to address either extremely large expenditures like roof expenditures to try to even out the cost to the taxpayers over the years or unanticipated costs because of the budget cycle we pass our budget in march for next june to july um, and you know you can't anticipate all the costs for example the the state law that came into effect that required us to uh, replace the oil tanks um, that wasn't anticipated when we were making our budget so so those unanticipated costs that's the other reason for these trust funds so I appreciate at some point in the future um, a better understanding of what um, funds are in place for yeah, anticipated we, costs. we can provide you a list of those there's the roof fund right, I if I remember correctly Larry will fix fix it if I'm wrong there's the the roof fund there's the building maintenance fund there's uh, in district and out of district special education um, trust funds and there is um, a building maintenance and repair, or a building improvement um, uh, and addition fund that has 187,000 in it that I mentioned before. I, did I miss any, Larry? No. So, so I really apologize because I'm just trying to understand. So what I hear is that some of these funds are only for emergency needs, unanticipated needs, and that there are only the only the roof. Fund. The roof fund is not for emergencies necessarily. So the roof the fund can be tapped into um, if we have, and we have seven school buildings. Yes. So we so just talked recently is there about are other the other needs that could be anticipated, and there are not funds in place to set aside money over time. Th that's needs. true. Um, you know, one large item that's on the capital improvement plan is repaving, for example. Uh, that's an expensive project if you do it all at once. Um, you could take the board could take the position that we want to start a fund and ask the voters to approve a fund where we put money away every year and then do all the paving at once uh, i think what we are more likely to do and we haven't really discussed this for a while and we'll wait for the facilities committee to give us their recommendation on it but instead we do it as it's needed um, and therefore it breaks out the cost and we can handle that within the capital budget thank you Thank you for the questions and for the comments. That's very helpful. Anyone else wish to speak to Article 6, the School Buildings Maintenance Fund? Anyone who hasn't spoken to it yet? Then come on up, Charlie. 
uh, probably more in the nature of a legal question, do the voters have the opportunity and the right to transfer any of these monies in any of these funds to the general fund or to some other specific project that may have come up? And this roof uh, trust fund at 800,000 is an example of it. Or is that limited just to the school board's authority? We'll let uh, district council speak to your question, Charlie. You're giving my brain kind of a workout today, Charlie. Um, the <laughs> the um, once a fund is set up, it may be spent only for the purpose for which the fund was set up, unless you do one of two things. You can, by supermajority, meaning two-thirds majority, vote to change the purpose of a fund, and then you can spend it for some other purpose. Or you can, by a simple majority vote, vote to discontinue the fund. If a fund is discontinued, the money lapses to surplus and you can appropriate it for some other purpose. But otherwise, no, you have to spend it for only the purpose for which it's stated. And DRA is quite strict about that. If it's a fund for maintenance, you can't use it to buy a new roof necessarily. You can do it to maintain the old roof. Thank you. I guess the question is, can the meeting here today do that by mean changing the purpose of the fund? I think no, it requires a warrant article. Thank you for the question, Charlie, and the answer. Any further discussion with respect to Article 6, the School Buildings Maintenance Fund? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve Article 6 and place it on the ballot for our March meetings. Do I have such a motion? Emilio, and a second? Yes, Mr. Gregor? Um, all in favor of Article 6, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Article 6 passes. With that, I believe we have finished all of the business uh, for today's meeting. I want to thank everyone for your thoughtful questions and comments. Thanks to the board, both board and the Municipal Budget Committee for responding to them. We appreciate all of your time spent here today. It's important for the district. I now would uh, entertain a motion to suspend our first session of our meeting, which is today, to our second session, which will be held in March at each of our town halls. Do I hear such a motion? Do I hear a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, everyone. Say this many times. Yeah,